track 14. He is a traitor. Allah is my witness. He has sold us into slavery, one of the sheikhs said. They growled like a pride of lions and looked to al-Malik. He is my brother and my caliph, said the prince. I am oath-bound to him. By God, he is no longer a ruler of Oman, a sheikh protested. He has become the plaything of the port. He who has sodomized a thousand boys has become the bum of the Turks, agreed another. By his treachery, you and all of us are released from our vows of fealty. Lead us, mighty lord, urged another. We are your men. Lead us to the gates of Muscat, and we will help you drive out the Ottoman, place you on the elephant throne of Oman. One after another they spoke, and all said the same thing. We have pleaded to you to come to us. Now we plead for you to lead us. We, the Tsar, are your oathmen. We can raise three thousand lances to ride at your back. What of the other tribes? the prince asked, not rushing into such a dire decision. What of the Awamir and the Bayet Imani? What of the Bayet Katir and the Harassis? We of the Tsar cannot speak for them, they answered, for there are blood feuds between us and many of them, but their sheikhs wait for you in the sands. Go to them, and God willing they will raise the war lance and ride with us to Muscat. Give us your decision, they begged. Give us your decision, and we will give you our oath. I will lead you, said the prince softly and simply, and their weathered brown faces lit with joy. One by one they knelt before him and kissed his feet. When he held out his curved dagger, they touched the steel with their lips. Then they took his hands, lifted the prince to his feet, and led him out of the tent to where the warriors waited in the moonlight. We give you the new Caliph of Oman, they told their men, who shouted their allegiance and fired their muskets into the air. The war drums began to beat, and the eerie blast of the ram's horns echoed from the dark cliffs above the grove. In the joyous commotion, Dorian came to his father and embraced him. I and my men are ready to take you to meet the sheikhs of the Awamir at the wells of Mukhaid. Then let us ride, my son, the prince agreed. Dorian left him and strode away through the grove, calling to his men. Saddle up, we ride at once. They ran to their camels, calling them by name, and soon the entire valley was in uproar as they broke camp. The camels bellowed and roared as they were loaded with their leather water skins, and the tents were collapsed and packed. Before the rise of the new moon in the cool of the night, they were ready to ride, a long column of robed, veiled men on their tall beasts. The prince's camel was a creamy yellow female. When he had seated himself on the saddle, Dorian commanded her to rise. With a groan, she lurched to her feet. Al Malik sat her easily. Born in the desert and a warrior from boyhood, he made a noble picture in the first rays of the rising moon. Dorian sent a vanguard of twenty men ahead and a rearguard to come up behind. He rode close beside the prince as the column started up the valley and headed out into the desert. They went swiftly, all racing camels, and but for the water skins, lightly burdened, they climbed up and out of the valley, and the desert stretched ahead, infinite and still, purple and dark hills of rock and shining dunes of silver sand stretching away to the north. Above the winding serpent of men and beasts, the stars were a dazzling field, like banks of wild white daisies after rain. The sand muted the fall of the camel's broad pads, and the only sound was the creak of leather and the occasional soft murmur of a voice warning, Beware! Ho! Dorian rode at ease, lulled by Ibrisam's rhythmic gait, and the harsh desert miles unwound beneath him. The dark hills formed strange, wondrous shapes around them, filled with shadows and mystery, and the stars and the crescent moon of Islam lit their way through the night. He gazed up at the sky, not merely to navigate through the darkness and the broken wilderness, but caught up in the mesmeric thrall of the ancient patterns of light and their inexorable march through the heavens. Strangely, this was the time when he felt closer to his past, when he seemed to feel the presence of Tom still near to him. They had spent so many nights together under the starry firmament when they were lads aboard the old seraph, 
perched up in the rigging. It had been Aboli, Big Daniel, and Ned Tyler who had taught him the names of all the navigational stars, and he whispered them aloud now. So many had Arabic names. Al-Nilam, Al-Nitak, Mintaka, Saif. Riding in the company of the man who had become his father, and these wild, falcon-fierce warriors whom he commanded, Dorian pondered the ancient prophecy of St. Taim Taim, as he had seen it written on the crumbling walls of the old sage tomb. Slowly he was overcome with an almost religious sense of some immutable destiny awaiting him here under these desert skies. They stopped after midnight, when the great scorpion lay low on the stony hills. One of the sheikhs of the Tsar came to the prince to make his farewells and to reiterate his vows. I go to raise my levy, he told al-Malik. Before the full of this moon I will meet you at the wells of Mach Shadid, with five hundred lances at my back, he promised. They watched his camel pace away swiftly into the east, until it was lost in the purple shadows. Then they went on. Twice more in the night, other sheikhs detached themselves from the main column, and after they had sought the prince's blessing, slipped away into the sands, leaving with the promise to meet again at the wells of Mach Shadid in the full of the moon. They went on until they discovered a field of lush Zara, which had sprung up where, months before, a thunderstorm had drenched a tiny part of the desert. They stopped and let the camels graze, while they cut bundles of the flour, for this was the finest of all camel foods and highly prized. When they had loaded it onto their mounts, they rode on until the dawn turned the eastern horizon orange and pink. They stopped again, this time to camp, couched the camels and fed them on the garnered zara. Then they made coffee and cakes of meal over smoky fires of dried camel dung. When they had eaten, they lay down wrapped in their robes. They slept through the hours of quivering heat, when the rocks danced in the mirage. Dorian lay close beside Ibrisam in her shadow, and the sound of her belches and the grinding of her jaws as she chewed the cud was familiar and lulling. He slept well and woke in the evening when the air was cooled. While the column roused itself and prepared for the long night march, Dorian sent a small patrol under Batula to scout ahead along their intended line of march. Then he mounted Ibrisam and rode back to sweep their back trail, making certain that they were not being followed. This was the way of this hard, hostile land, where the tribes lived in a perpetual state of blood feud and war, where raids for camels and women were part of desert life, and vigilance was the centre of every man's existence. Dorian found that the back trail was clear. He turned back, urged Ibrisam into a swinging trot, and soon caught up with the main column. After midnight they reached the bitter wells of Chayel Yayamin. A small encampment of the Tsar was already there, and they came out of their tents and surrounded the prince's camel, ululating and firing joy shots in the air. They camped for two days under the straggly date palms at Chayel Yayamin, where the water in the wells was so brackish that it could only be drunk when mixed with camel's milk. The men had to climb down deep into the earth to reach it, and they carried it up to the surface in leather bags to water the camels. After the long, waterless journey, the camels drank with relish. Ibrisam drank repeatedly and sucked up twenty-five gallons during the next few hours. The last of the sheikhs of the Tsar left the column here and scattered out into the wilderness to find their people, leaving Prince al-Malik with only Dorian's small force to guide and protect him on the last leg of the journey to meet the Awamir at the wells of Mukhaid. It took them three nights of travel to cross the salt flats before the hills of Shia. Even in the moonlight the flats were white as a snowfield, and the pads of the camels left a dark path over the shiny surface. On the third morning they saw the hills rise far ahead of them, a pale blue line, serrated like the fangs of a tiger shark against the dawn. They camped for the day in a shallow wadi, where a growth of thorny guff trees gave them some shelter from the sun. Before he lay down to sleep, Dorian climbed to the lip of the wadi to study the line of hills that lay ahead. The red, rugged rock was highlighted by the rising sun. 
the hills of Shia marked the boundary between the territories of the Saar and the Awamir. Dorian picked out a peak shaped like a castle turret. The Saar called it the Witch's Tower. It marked the pass through the range that would take them into the domain of the Awamir. Dorian smiled with satisfaction that he had led the column across the trackless plains directly to the pass, then stood up and went down into the wadi to find shade and rest for the day. That evening, when the column was ready to continue the march, Dorian rode back as usual to sweep the back trail. Half a mile from the camp, he cut the spore of a strange camel. By now, he had grown so adept in the ways of the desert that he could recognise the tracks of every beast in their column. These tracks showed that the unknown rider had come out of the west and crossed their trail. Dorian read how the man had dismounted to examine their trail, then remounted, and followed it for almost two miles before shearing off and riding to a low shale bank that rose like the spine of an elephant out of the salt-white plain. Behind this cover he had left his camel and crawled to the top of the ridge. His snake-like drag marks were clear for Dorian to read. When Dorian followed these to the crest of the ridge, he found that he overlooked the camp among the guff trees where the column had spent the day. Dorian saw that the stranger had lain on the ridge for a while, then drawn back and run down to where he had tethered his camel. He had ridden off, making a wide circle around the encampment, then headed directly towards the hills of Shia and the witch's tower above the pass. The spy had at least eight hours' lead on the column and would have reached the pass by now. The implications were sinister. The news of the arrival of al-Malik and his journey through the desert to meet the leaders of the tribes would almost certainly have reached the caliph in Muscat and his Ottoman allies. They might have sent a force to intercept him, and the logical place to set up an ambush would be at the pass of the witch's tower. Dorian took only minutes to decide his next action. He swung up onto Ibrahim's saddle and urged her into a run. They sped away across the white flats, and within a short time he saw the column ahead, dark shadows on the shining earth. The rear guard challenged him as he came up, then recognised Ibrisam. It is Al-Salil, by God! Where is Batula? Dorian shouted as he came within hail. His lance-bearer galloped back to him. As he reached Dorian's side, he threw back his veil and uncovered his face. You come in haste, master. There is danger. A stranger rides in our shadow, Dorian told him. He has watched us from afar while we camped. Then he rode off towards the pass, perhaps to warn the men who are waiting there. Quickly he explained to Batula what he had found, then sent him out with two companions to follow up the tracks of the stranger. He watched them ride away and urged Ibrisam on to catch up with the prince. Our Malik listened intently while Dorian made his report. There are many enemies. Almost certainly these are the servants of the Ottoman, or of my brother the Caliph. Allah knows, there are many who would prevent me reaching the tribes of the interior. What do you plan, my son? Dorian pointed ahead. The dark hills of Shia were an unbroken barrier rising five hundred feet above the salt flats. Lord, we do not know how many of the enemy there are. I have thirty men, and can laugh at twice or thrice that number of enemy. However, if the Ottoman have got wind of your journey, they may have sent an army to find you. That is likely. The pass at the Witch's Tower is the main and swiftest route through the hills to reach the Awamir. But there is another lesser pass further to the west, Dorian pointed across the Silver Plain. It is known as the Pass of the Bright Gazelle and to reach it will take us many leagues out of our way, but I cannot risk riding into the witch's tower and being trapped in its gut by a large force of the Ottoman. Our Balik nodded. How far to this other pass? Can we reach it before daybreak? No, Dorian replied. Even if we drive the camels hard, we will not be there before the middle of the morning. Then let us ride, said Al-Malik. Dorian called to his men of the vanguard and ordered them to change direction towards the west. They closed up, and with the prince in the centre of the line, every man alert for an ambush, they pushed the camels harder. The beasts were still fresh and strong, and the salt crystals crunched under their pads. A soft white dust cloud rose up and sparkled behind them in the still night air as they sped forward. They halted for a short while after midnight to let the camels blow, and to drink a cup of water mixed with camel's milk. 
then went on. In that darkest hour of the night, four hours before dawn, there was a shout of alarm from the riders in the rear guard of the column. Dorian turned his camel and raced back. What is it? he began, then broke off as he spotted the dark clump of camels coming towards them out of the night. There were few, but they might be outriders of an army. Close up the ranks, he ordered, and loosened the butt of his lance in its leather boot. Swiftly the column evolved into a defensive formation, with the prince in the centre where they could protect him. Then Dorian urged Iprisam forward and challenged the approaching men with a shouted question. Al Salim! The response was immediate, and he recognised Batula's voice. Batula! He rode to meet his lance-bearer. They came together at a gallop, then Dorian turned Ibrasam to run alongside Batula's mount so they could talk. What news? A war party. Many men, Batula replied. They were waiting at the witch's tower. How many? Five hundred, perhaps more. Who? Turks and Masakara. The Masakara were the tribe from the coastal lands around Muscat and Sir. Dorian had no doubt that they were the Caliph's men, especially if Turks were with them. Encamped? No, they are riding hard in pursuit of us. How do they know we've changed direction? I can only guess that they must have many scouts watching us. And we saw your dust cloud for many miles. It shines like a beacon fire in the moonlight. Dorian looked up and saw it obscuring half the sky above them. How far are they behind you? Batula threw back the cloth from his face and grinned in the starlight. If it were daylight, you would be able to see their dust cloud clearly. Loosen your lance, Al Salil. They will be good fighting before the sun sets tomorrow. They raced onwards all that night, until the dawn flushed the eastern sky and the light grew stronger. Ride on, Dorian called to the prince, turned Ibrisam aside, and headed for a pimple of dark lava that rose abruptly fifty feet out of the flat white plain to their left. When he reached it, he jumped down from the saddle and scrambled to the top of it. The dawn flared before his eyes, and the light came swiftly, that miraculous birth of the desert day. The wild hills of Shia stood tall and serried ahead of him. Their colours were as gorgeous as those of some tropical bird, bright gold and red, with bars of purple and buttresses of crimson. He could clearly see the pass of the bright gazelle, a dark blue cleft that split the sheer rugged cliffs from top to bottom. The white sands were piled up at the base of the hills in a sloping ramp, and the wind had carved the soft dunes below the gaudy rock face into weird, fantastic shapes. Then Dorian looked back the way they had come and saw the dust cloud of the Turks billowing up from the glistening plain close behind him. At that moment the rising sun shot its first arrow of light through a gap in the crest of the hills. Although Dorian was still in shadow, the plain behind him was lit, and he saw the sunlight sparkle on the lance heads of the approaching riders. Batula was wrong, he whispered, as he saw their multitudes. There are many more than he counted. A thousand, perhaps. They were spread out over a wide front, many squadrons, some obscured by the dust of those ahead. There must have been a traitor, Dorian mused. They could not have sent this vast array had they not known for certain that the prince was coming this way. The closest squadron of the enemy was near the centre of the line, a small band that had outstripped the main body, leaving them floundering along behind. They were so close that he could see the shapes of the camels and the riders on their backs through the gossamer sheets of rolling dust. He could not count them, but he guessed there were two hundred in this group, and judging from the way in which they rode, they were hard fighting men. He narrowed his eyes as he tried to estimate their speed and compare it to the pace of the fleeing column of his own men. Those camels out there were fresh and fleet, while his own beast had run all night. The enemy were outrunning them, and it would be a closer race to reach the pass of the bright gazelle. He ran down to where Ibrisam stood, and leapt up onto her back. She sprang away at the touch of his riding wand, and fled in pursuit of the column. 
As he emerged from behind the cover of the rocks, the pursuers spotted him, and he heard their faint but warlike cries carrying in the cool morning air. Dorian swivelled in the saddle and looked back just in time to see the puffs of gun smoke as the riders in the leading ranks fired at him. The range was too long, and he did not even hear the flight of the musket balls. Ibrisam, the silk wind, ran on untouched and caught up with their own band at the start of the sand ramp that led up to the foot of the cliffs. This was a slithering slope of loose, crystalline particles that gave under the weight of the camels and ran back like water beneath their pads. The column struggled upwards, sliding back half a pace for every one they gained, and the camels moaned with fear at the treacherous footing. One of the leading animals went down on its haunches, lunging wildly to regain its feet, then rolled backwards, crushing its rider under the saddle. Dorian was close enough to hear the screams and the crackle of the bones as both the man's legs snapped. Then the heavy beast slid back in a tangle to the foot of the ramp, leaving the slope behind it littered with water skins and broken equipment, dragging its rider down with it, caught in the traces. Dorian jumped down, and with his sword cut the injured man free. Batula saw what he was doing and turned back to help him. His mount slid down the slope in sheets of flying sand, and at the bottom he jumped down beside Dorian. Between them they lifted the injured man, his shattered legs dangling up onto Ibrisam's back. The tail of the column was already halfway up the slope. The prince and the vanguard had reached the foot of the rocks and were disappearing into the dark cleft of the pass through the hills. Dorian seized Ibrisam's halter, dragged her head round and started her up the dune. He glanced back over the plain and saw the pursuit bearing down upon them. Their mounts were stretched out at full run, the dust boiling out behind them, the riders on their backs brandishing their weapons, howling war cries into the wind, robes streaming out behind them, racing in to cut them down while they struggled up the treacherous slope. Abruptly, from high above, came the blast of musket fire. The prince had rallied the men as they reached the mouth of the pass, and the crash of the volley echoed and boomed along the cliff face. Dorian saw at least three of the onrushing riders knocked from the saddle by heavy lead balls, and one of the camels must have been struck in the brain, for it dropped so suddenly that it cartwheeled, haunches overhead, flinging its rider high as it sprawled on the hard-baked earth. The charge lost speed and impetus, and as Dorian and Batula toiled up the soft slope, another volley of musket fire swept over their heads. It was answered by a rattle of rolling fire from the foot of the dunes, where the enemy were dismounting and turning their jezels on the struggling pair exposed on the ramp above them. Lead balls kicked up spurts of sand around Dorian's feet, but there seemed a, a charm of protection over him, for despite the rain of shots, he and Batula battled on. Running with sweat and gasping for breath, they dragged the camels over the top of the sand ramp and onto the stony ledge at the mouth of the pass. Dorian looked around him swiftly as he heaved and panted for breath. The other camels had been led into shelter behind the first turn of the high stone walls, and his men had couched them there, then run back to take up positions among the rocks from where they could fire down on the enemy. Dorian looked out across the plain below and saw the Ottoman squadrons strung out over miles of the pale earth, but all headed in his direction. He made a swift count of their numbers. Certainly close to a thousand, he decided, and wiped the stinging sweat from his eyes with his headcloth. Then he examined Ibrisam quickly, running his hands over her flanks and haunches, dreading to find blood from a bullet wound. But she was unharmed. He tossed the halter rope to Batula. Take the camels to safety, he ordered, and have the injured man cared for. While Batula led the beasts deeper into the gut of the pass, Dorian went to find the prince. Al Malik squatted, musket in hand, unharmed and composed, quietly directing the musketeers among the rocks. Dorian crouched beside him. Lord, this is not your business. It is mine. The prince smiled at him. You have done well thus far. You should have left that clumsy fellow to fend for himself. Your life is worth a hundred of his. Dorian ignored both the rebuke and the compliment. He said quietly, With half the men I can hold the enemy here for many days, until our water is spent. 
I will send Batula and the other half to escort you through the pass and on to the oasis of Mukhaid. The prince looked into his face, his expression grave. The odds would be twenty against a thousand, and though the position was strong, they could expect the enemy to be determined and resourceful. He knew the sacrifice Dorian was offering. Leave Batula here, he said, and come with me to Mukhaid. The tone of his voice was a question, not an order. No, my lord, Dorian rejected it. I cannot do that. My place is here with my men. You are right. The prince rose to his feet. I cannot force you to neglect your duty, but I can command you not to fight here to the death. Dorian shrugged. Death makes his own choices. He brooks no argument from us. Hold them here for the rest of the day and the night, al-Malik said. That will give me time to reach Mukhaid and rally the Awamir. I will come back for you with an army. As my lord commands, said Dorian. But the prince saw the battle lust in his green eyes, and it made him uneasy. Al-Salil, he said firmly, and gripped Dorian's shoulder to reinforce the words. I cannot tell how long it will take for me to return with the men of the Awamir. Hold them here until dawn tomorrow, no longer than that. Then run to join me as fast as Ibrahim will carry you. You are my talisman, and I cannot afford to lose you. Lord, you must leave at once. Every moment is precious. They went back together to the camels, and Dorian gave swift orders, dividing the men into two groups, those who would stay to hold the pass and those who would ride with the prince. They shared out what remained of the water and food, a fourth part for the prince and the remainder for Dorian's party. We will leave all of our muskets with you, the five barrels of black powder and the bags of lead shot the prince told Dorian. We will put it to good employment, Dorian promised. Within minutes it was done, and the prince and Batula mounted at the head of the departing party. The prince looked down from the saddle at Dorian. Allah be your shield, my son, he said. Go with God, my father, Dorian replied. That is the first time you have called me that. It is the first time I have felt it to be true. You do me honour, said Al-Malik gravely, and touched his camel's neck with the riding wand. Dorian watched them wind away down the narrow passage between the high rock walls and disappear around the first turn. Then he put all else from his mind except the coming battle. He strode back to the entrance to survey the plain and the cliffs with a soldier's eye. He considered the height of the sun. It was only a little past noon. It was going to be a long day and an even longer night. He picked out the weak spots in his defence, which the enemy would exploit, and made his plans as to how he would counter each move they made. First they will try a direct assault straight up the slope, he decided, as he looked at the massing below, on the edge of the plain. He went among his men, laughing and bantering with them, moving them into the best defensive positions among the rocks, making certain that each had full powder flasks and shot bags. He had not finished setting out the last of his pickets, before he heard a distant blast of a horn from the bottom of the slope, followed immediately by the beat of war drums and a swelling shout from the first wave of attackers who rushed forward and started up the slope. Steady, Dorian called to his men. Hold your fire, brothers of the warrior blood. He slapped the shoulder of a man with long dark locks of tangled hair spilling over his shoulders, and they grinned into each other's faces. The first shot will be the sweetest, Ahmed. Make it tell. He went on down the line. Wait until they are staring down your barrel, Hassan. I want a clean kill from you with your first bullet, Mustafa. Let them get so close that even you cannot miss, Salim. Though he laughed and joked, he was watching the attackers come up the slope. These were Turks, heavier men than the bird-like Arabs of the desert, with long moustaches and round bronze helmets with nose pieces, and gillets of chain armour over their robes of striped wool. Heavy gear for the desert, Dorian thought, as they toiled up the ramp of the loose sand, the first wild rush slowly becoming a laboured climb. Dorian walked out onto the lip of the slope as if to welcome them, and stood with his hands on his hips, grinning down at them. 
Not only did he want to inspire his men by his example, he also wanted to make certain that none could disobey his order and open fire while he was standing in front of them. One of the Turks below paused and threw up his musket. His face was shiny with sweat, and his hands shook with the effort of the climb. Dorian steeled himself, and the Turk fired. The ball hissed past Dorian's head, and the wind flipped a lock of his red-gold hair across his cheek and lips. Is that the best you goat lovers can do? He laughed down at them. Come up here, come and taste the hospitality of the Tsar. His taunts gave the leaders fresh wind, and they broke into a clumsy, lurching run up the last few yards of the ramp. Dorian stepped back into the ranks of his own men. Ready now, brethren, he said quietly, and cocked the hammer of his jezel. A line of Turks came shoulder to shoulder over the lip. Their faces were flushed darkly, bathed in sweat, as they staggered on to the level jezels of the Tsar. Most had discarded their own muskets during the climb. Now they brandished their scimitars, and with a hoarse yell threw themselves on the defenders. Now! shouted Dorian, and the Tsar fired together. Twenty muskets in a single prolonged blast of gunsmoke and ball. It swept through the lines of Turks. Dorian saw his own shot punch a gap in the yellow teeth of a burly, moustached Turk in front of him. The man's head snapped back. Blood and brain tissue burst out of the back of his skull and the sword flew from his hand. He fell back into the man who teetered on the crest of the slope behind him, throwing him off balance so that they fell together and rolled down the sand ramp, knocking down another three men who were climbing up it, sending them all down to the bottom. Take the blade to them now! Dorian called, and they sprang out from behind the rocks and charged into the milling throng of Turks on the ledge. That murderous charge drove the Ottomans back, stumbling over their own dead and over the edge of the ramp. The ledge was cleared, and the Tsar met the men who were still struggling up towards them. They had the advantage of height, and the Turks were almost exhausted by the time they came within sword play. The struggle was swiftly over and the attackers broken, dead, and wounded. Those who had not been hurt slipped and slithered back down, ignoring the angry shouts of their captains, running over them and carrying them away in the rout. The Tsar danced on the ledge, beards and robes swirling, hurling taunts and obscene insults after the enemy. Dorian saw at a glance that he had not lost a single man, either killed or wounded, while at least a dozen Turkish corpses were half buried in the fine sand of the dune below. That was only the first course of the banquet. He controlled his own jubilation. No more than a hundred Turks had come at them in that rash charge. They won't try that again. He strode among his men, shouting to them to reload the muskets, but it took him some time to get them under control again. I want ten men up in the cliffs. He picked them out by name and sent them climbing up the rock walls to where they could observe the whole front of the hills and any move the enemy made. He guessed that they would now send men to climb the sand dunes on each side of the mouth of the pass, out of musket range of Dorian's men. Then they would regroup on the ledge and close in from both sides. Combined with another frontal attack, this would be more difficult to resist. Dorian knew that his men must eventually be driven back into the gut of the pass, and it was there in the narrow passage that they would be forced to make their final stand. Relying on the men he had posted high in the cliffs to give warning of the next attack, he took six men into the pass to select the best defensive position. It was almost three years since he had last travelled this way, but he remembered that there was a narrow place where the rock pinched in. When he found it again, the gap was barely wide enough for a loaded camel to pass through. Beyond it was a rockfall, and at his orders the six Tsar laid aside their weapons and used the loose rock from the fall to fortify the gap, building a sangar across it, behind which they could shelter. The camels were couched deeper in the pass beyond the next twist of the passage, and Dorian went to check that they were saddled and ready for a quick escape when the enemy broke through the sangar. Ibrisam groaned with love when she saw him, and he caressed her head before he left her to go back to the mouth of the pass. The men he had sent to climb the rock walls were in position above him, and the others were spread out along the ledge. 
They were loading the extra muskets that the prince had left with them, and setting these close at hand. That would give them an extra shot when the fighting was heavy. Dorian squatted on the ledge and looked down upon the enemy. Even though the sun was high now and the heat becoming fierce, the white salt flats swarmed with activity. Troops of mounted men were still coming up to swell the ranks of the enemy, and Turkish officers were riding back and forth along the foot of the sand dunes, studying the lie of the land. Their helmets and weapons sparkled, and the white dust hung in a shimmering curtain over them. Suddenly there was an even more agitated movement among the troops directly below where Dorian sat, and a horn sounded a fanfare. A small party was approaching, the outriders carrying banners of green and scarlet, the colours of the sublime port. There could be little doubt that this was the command party of the enemy force. As they drew closer, Dorian studied them with interest. He picked out two figures in the centre of the group, who, judging by their splendid dress and the rich caparisons of their camels, were high-ranking officers. One was a Turk, for he carried the round bronze shield and wore the helmet with steel nosepiece. The Ottoman general, Dorian decided, and turned his attention to the second man, an Arab. Even at this distance, there was something vaguely familiar about him, and Dorian stirred uneasily. He was swaddled in fine woolen robes, but Dorian could see he was a big man. The band of his headdress was of gold filigree, and the scabbard of the curved dagger on his waist shone with the same lustrous metal. There were even gold sandals on his feet. Damn me, but I know him. Dorian's sense of recognition grew stronger, and he racked his memory to try to put a name to him. The command party drew up at the foot of the dunes, well out of musket shot of Dorian's men on the ledge, and the Turkish commander lifted a telescope to his eye and peered up at the mouth of the pass. He completed a leisurely survey of the cliff face, then lowered the glass and spoke to his officers, who were grouped obsequiously behind him. Immediately they wheeled away and began to give orders to the squadrons of waiting troops. There was another burst of activity. They were doing exactly what Dorian had anticipated. Within a short while, hundreds of heavily armed men were climbing the slope on both sides of the mouth of the pass. They were keeping well out of musket shot of the little group of defenders, but Dorian knew that when they reached the ledge, they would creep in, then try to rush the entrance to the pass. Al Salim! The dung-eating Turks are coming up to us again. Dorian's lookouts on the cliffs above called their observations down to him. From their vantage points they could see more than he, and they warned him when the first of the enemy reached the ledge and began to move along it towards the centre. Shoot any who come within range, Dorian shouted back, and immediately a fusillade of musket shots echoed along the cliff. The Tsar were firing down upon the ledge, and the Turks were returning their fire. Occasionally there came a scream as a man was hit, but the shouts from the lookouts warned that the enemy were gradually working into a position from which they could launch their first assault on the mouth of the pass. Even though he was distracted by action all around him, Dorian kept watching the gold-bedecked Arab who rode beside the Turkish general. At last a train of baggage camels came up from the rear, and from these were offloaded a painted leather tent. Twenty men unrolled it, set it up on the white plain, and spread rugs and cushions in its shade. The Turkish general dismounted and went to take his place on the rugs. The Arab dandy couched his camel also, and clambered down awkwardly from the saddle. He followed the Turk to the tent, and now Dorian could see the breadth of his shoulders and the swell of his belly under the woolen robe. He had not taken more than a few paces when Dorian noticed the limp. He was favouring his right foot. It was enough to jolt his memory. He remembered their fight on the steps of the old tomb in the garden of the Zenana at Lamu, and the fall that had broken that foot. Zain, he whispered, Zain al-Din. It was his old enemy from childhood days, now costumed like a prince of Oman and riding at the head of an army. Dorian felt all the old hatred and antagonism return in full flood. Zain was the enemy once again. But what's he doing here? Hunting his own father? Dorian puzzled. Does he know that I am here also? He tried to make sense out of this strange, unlooked-for circumstance. 
Zain had been at the court of Muscat for so long that he would have been caught up in the convoluted maelstrom of royal intrigue, probably trained and encouraged by his uncle the Caliph. Unless Zain had changed greatly from the boy Dorian had known, he would have taken readily to the conspiracies of the court. It was clear that he had become another pawn of the sublime port. Perhaps he was at the centre of the capitulation of Omam to the Ottoman. You traitorous swine, Dorian muttered, staring down at him with a loathing. You would sell your country and your people, even your own father. What was the price? What reward have the port offered you, Zain? The throne itself? As their puppet in Muscat? Zain al-Din took his seat beside the Turkish general in the shade of the tent fly, and a slave placed a cup in his hand. He sipped from it, and Dorian saw that he had grown a thin, straggling beard, but that his cheeks were smooth and plump. He stared up directly at Dorian, who pulled off the headdress and shook out his shining gold curls. The cup slipped from Zain's fingers as he recognised him. Dorian waved gaily at him. Zayn made no reply, but seemed to crouch a little lower, hunching down like a bloated toad. At that moment there was a sudden heavy burst of firing along the cliffs on the right, and Dorian turned away to bolster the defence on that side of the pass. "'Beware, Al-Salil!' one of the lookouts called. "'They are coming!' "'How many?' Dorian shouted back, and dropped behind the rock with Ahmed. "'Many!' came the reply. "'Too many!' On this side the cliffs formed a jagged buttress that turned back upon itself, so that they could not see more than twenty paces along the open ledge, but they could hear the voices of the men beyond the corner of the cliff, and their footsteps as they pressed forward, the clatter of a bronze shield on rock, the creak of leather thongs on breastplate and scabbard belt. "'Steady!' Dorian called to his men. "'Wait for them! Let them come close!' Suddenly a rank of Turks charged around the corner of the cliff straight at them. The ledge was only wide enough for three at a time, but others pressed close behind them, right on their heels. Allah Akbar, they howled. God is great. There was a tall pockmarked man in the front rank with a steel Saracen helmet on his head, chain mail covering his torso and a double-bladed battle-axe in his hands. He jumped out ahead of his comrades and singled out Dorian, locking eyes with him and charging straight at him with the axe held in both hands above his head. He was an arm's length away. The muzzle of the long jezel almost touched his face as Dorian fired. The ball hit the Turk in the throat, and he dropped to his knees, clutching the wound. A severed artery pumped out blood between his fingers in thick, glutinous jets, and he fell forward on his face. Dorian dropped the empty musket and snatched up the loaded one that lay at hand and cocked the hammer. Another man jumped over the dying Turk and Dorian shot him in the chest. He went down kicking and twitching on the rock ledge. Dorian threw down the empty musket and drew his sword. He stepped forward to block the ledge. Ahmed was on his right and Salim on the left, their shoulders touching. The enemy came at them in a mob three at a time, but with others close behind, ready to step into the gaps left by the men who fell. Dorian loved the feel of a good blade in his hand. This weapon he held now had been a parting gift from the prince when he had sailed from Lamu. It was of Damascus steel, limber as a willow wand and sharp as the tooth of a serpent. He killed the first man who came at him cleanly, lunging under the rim of his helmet into his dark eye, skewering the eyeball like a sheep's kidney on a kebab, and sending the steel on into his brain. Recovering swiftly, Dorian disengaged the blade and let his victim drop. Then the others rushed forward behind their bronze shields, and there was no longer space nor pause for fine swordplay. Shoulder to shoulder, in the pack and surge, they hacked and stabbed and shouted, swaying back and forth and side to side across the narrow ledge. The warning cry from the Saar lookouts in the cliff face was almost drowned by the shouting, the clatter of steel on steel, the trampling and shoving. On to the left side and the front, Dorian heard it, and cut down another man before he jumped back from the fight, letting Mustafa, who was behind him, move up into his place in the line. He looked about him and saw that while he had been fighting on the right, 
the Turks had launched a series of attacks at every other point. Five of his men were fighting desperately to hold the far side of the entrance where the enemy were pressing forward along the ledge. At the same time, 200 Turks were coming directly up the sand slope to their front. In the few moments that it took him to make this appraisal, two of his men were killed. Salim had half his head cut away by the swing of an axe blade, and Mustafa took a sword thrust through the lungs and dropped to his knees, belching bright gouts of blood. Dorian knew he could not afford these losses, and the Turks coming up the slope had almost reached the ledge. The men he had placed in the cliffs had not waited for his order, but were scrambling down to join the fighting. He was grateful when they jumped the last ten feet onto the rock beside him. By now both his flanks were buckling under the pressure, and at any moment a wave of the enemy would come roaring over the front of the ledge. Back to back, Dorian yelled. Cover each other back into the pass. They formed a tight defensive ring, and the Turks bayed around them as they fell back quickly into the mouth of the pass, but they lost more men to the flashing blades and musket balls fired at close range. Now, Dorian gave the order, run! They spun round and pounded back deeper into the pass, dragging their wounded with them, while the enemy jammed in the entrance, obstructing each other by their numbers as they tried to pursue. Dorian was in the lead as they raced around the bend in the rock passage, and he shouted to the six men behind the walls of the Sangar, Hold your fire! It's us! The rock wall of the Sangar was chest high, and they had to scramble over it. The men waiting behind the wall helped to drag the wounded over the top. As the last of the Sar fell over the wall, the enemy came roaring down the rock passage close behind him. The six men who had not taken any part in the fighting so far were desperate to join in. They had loaded all the remaining muskets and stacked them along the side of the cliff, and they had planted the long lances in the earth, close at hand for when the Turks breached the Sangar. The first volley into the front rank of the Turks brought them up short, and there was confusion and dismay, as those in front tried to retreat, and their comrades coming up behind pushed them forward. Another close-quarter volley, with the second battery of reloaded muskets, tipped the balance, and the remaining Turks fled back down the passage to disappear around the bend in the rock. Although they were hidden by the curved rock wall, the voices of the Turks were magnified by the surrounding walls, and Dorian could hear every word as they cursed the Tsar and urged each other to attack again. He knew that there would be only a brief respite before the next assault. Water, he ordered. Bring a water skin. The heat in the pass was like a bread oven, and the fighting had been heavy and hot. They gulped down the foul, brackish liquid from the bitter wells at Chayel Ya Yamin, as though it was sweet sherbet. Where is Hassan? Doran asked as he counted heads. I saw him fall, one of his men replied, but I was carrying Zaid, and I could not go back for him. Dorian felt the loss, for Hassan had been one of his favourites. Now he had only twelve men still able to fight. They had dragged back five of their wounded, but others had had to be left to the mercy of the Turks. Now they carried the five wounded back to where the camels were couched. Then Dorian divided the survivors into four equal groups. The wall of the Sangar was wide enough for only three of them to man it at a time. Dorian positioned the three other groups behind the leading rank. After each volley they would fall back to reload and the other ranks would step up to take their turn. In this fashion, he hoped to maintain a steady fire into the Turks as they came forward to the attack. He might be able to hold them off until dark, but he doubted that they could survive the night. So few of the Tsar were still on their feet, and the Turks had a reputation as terrible and doughty fighters. He knew they would be resourceful enough to find some strategy to thwart their best efforts of defence. All he could hope for was to buy time for al-Malik, and in the end, they would have to try to fight their way out with lance and sword. They settled down behind the Sangar in the hushed, heated air of the pass, husbanding their strength. I would trade my place in paradise for a pipe of keef now. Mishka grinned as he wrapped a strip of filthy, sweat-soaked cloth around the sword cut in his upper arm. The heady smoke of the herb made the smoker fearless and oblivious to the pain of his wounds. 
I will make one for you and light it with my own hands when we sit in the halls of Muscat, Dorian promised, then broke off as somebody called his name. Al Salim! My brother! The voice echoed and resonated from the rock. My heart rejoices to see you again! It was high-pitched, almost girlish. Although the timbre had changed, Dorian recognised it. How is your foot, Zayn al-Din? he called back. Come, let me break the other for you, to balance your duck waddle. Out of sight behind the bend of the passage, Zayn giggled. <laughs> we will come, my brother. Believe me, we will come, and when we do, I shall laugh while my Turkish allies lift the skirts of your robe and bend you over the saddle of your camel. I think you would enjoy that more than I would, Zayn. Dorian used the feminine form of address, as though he was speaking to a woman, and Zain was silent for a while. "'Listen, Al-Salil,' he shouted again. "'This is your blood-brother Hassan. "'You left him behind when you ran like a cowardly jackal. "'He still lives.' Dorian felt a chill of dread blow down his spine. "'He is a brave man, Zain al-Din.' Let him die with dignity, he called back. Our son had been his friend since the first day he had come to live among the Tsar. He had two young wives and four little sons, the oldest only five years of age. A terrible scream came down the passage, a scream of mortal agony and outrage, which descended into a sobbing moan. Here is a gift for you from your friend. Something small, soft, and bloody was lobbed around the corner of the passage. It rolled in the sandy earth and came to rest in front of the Sangha wall. "'You are in need of another pair of balls, Al-Salil, my brother,' Zain Aldin called. "'There they are. Hassan will not need them where he is going.' The Tsar growled and cursed, and Dorian felt tears sting his eyelids. His voice choked as he shouted back, I swear in the name of God that I will do the same for you one day. Oh, my brother, Zain called back, if this dog of a Tsar is so dear to you, I will send him back to you, but before I do, I wish to look at his liver. There was another terrible scream. Then Hassan was thrust out into the open and sent staggering down the passage towards the Sangha. He was naked, and between his legs was a dark hole, mushy with blood. They had ripped open his belly, and his entrails dangled around his knees, slippery and purple. He reeled towards Dorian, his mouth open. He made a cawing animal sound, and his mouth was a blood-drenched cave. Zain al-Din had cut out his tongue. Before he reached the Sangha wall, he collapsed and lay wriggling weakly in the dust. Dorian leapt over the wall with the musket in his hand. He placed the muzzle at the back of Hassan's head and fired. His skull collapsed like a rotten melon. At the sound of the shot, the Turks came pouring down the passage like a wave of storm water. Dorian jumped back over the wall. Fire! he shouted to his men, and the first volley of musket balls slapped like thrown gravel into the front rank of the attackers. The fighting raged back and forth for the few hours of daylight that remained. Gradually the passage clogged with the enemy dead. They were piled almost as high as the rock wall, and a thick fog of gun smoke filled the depths of the pass so that the air was hard to breathe, and they panted and gasped as they fired and reloaded. The smoke mingled with the metallic smell of blood and the gas from the torn intestines, and in the heat the sweat poured down their bodies and burned their eyes with its salt. Using their own dead as an assault ladder, the Turks managed to climb over the top of the wall three times, and three times Dorian and his Tsar hurled them back. As darkness fell, there were only seven Arabs still able to stand beside him, and all were wounded. In the lull between each attack, they dragged their dead and wounded back to where the camels were couched. There was no one to tend the injured men, so Dorian placed a water skin beside those who still had the strength to drink from it. Jaub, who was nicknamed the Cat, had had his right shoulder shattered by the blow of a battle-axe, and Dorian could not staunch the pumping arterial bleeding. "'It is time for me to leave you, 
Al-Salil, Job whispered as he struggled to his knees. Hold my sword for me. Dorian could not refuse this last request. He could not leave this comrade of a dozen battles to the Turks. With ice in his heart, he set the hilt of the sword firmly in the sand and placed the point of the curved blade in the notch below the sternum, aimed up towards the heart. The blessing of Allah and his prophet on you, my friend. Jaub thanked him and fell forward. The blade slid in full length, and the point, smeared with blood, came out between his shoulder blades. Dorian stood up and ran back to the wall just as another rush of Turks came howling down the gut of the pass. They hurled them back at last, but two more of the Tsar had gone down. I had hoped to hold them longer, Dorian thought, as he leaned heavily on the blood-soaked wall. I had hoped to give my father more time to raise the Awamir, that there are too few of us left, and it is almost over now. It was becoming very dark in the passage. Soon the Turks would be able to creep up to the foot of the wall unseen. Bin Shibam, he croaked to the man beside him, for his throat was swollen with thirst and strained with shouting. Bring the last water skin and the bundles of firewood from the camel loads. We will drink and light the night with our last fire. The leaping flames lit the rock walls of the pass with a ruddy, flickering light, and at intervals one of the Tsar threw a burning brand over the wall to dispel the shadows in which the Turks might crawl forward. There was a lull now. They could hear the Turks talking beyond the bend, and the groans of the wounded and dying were hideous. But still the next attack did not come. They sat in a small, lonely huddle against the wall, drinking the last of the water and helping each other bind up their wounds. All of them were hurt, but although Dorian had been in the thick of the fighting all that day, his injuries were the least grave. There was a deep cut on the back of his left arm and a sword thrust through the same shoulder. But I still have my right arm to wield a sword, he told the man who was fashioning an arm sling for him from a length of rope from the camel tack. I think we have done all we can here. If any of you wishes to leave, take a camel and ride with my thanks and my blessing. This is a good place to die, said the man beside him. The Uris of Paradise will be sad that we disregard their call, another refused Dorian's offer. Then they all looked up in mild alarm as a pebble clattered down from high above, bouncing from wall to wall, striking tiny sparks from the rock. They have climbed the cliffs and are over our heads, Dorian jumped to his feet. Douse the fire. The flames would light them for the men high above to see their position. His warning came too late. Suddenly the air around them was filled with a thunderous roar, like that of a great waterfall, and a bombardment of rocks came hurtling down upon them. Some of the boulders were the size of powder kegs, others only as large as a man's head, but there was no shelter from this lethal rain in the gut of the pass. Three more men were crushed in the first few moments, and the others struck down as they ran back along the passage to the camels. Dorian was the only one to get through. He reached Ibrasam's side and threw himself into the saddle. Hut, hut, he urged her to her feet. But as she rose, the bombardment of boulders ceased abruptly, and the Turks swarmed over the wall behind him. They stabbed the wounded Arabs, then, with barely a pause, rushed forward to surround Ibrasam. Dorian hit one of them in the chest with the lance, driving the steel head in deeply against the clinging resistance of living flesh, but the shaft snapped off in his hand, and he hurled the stump into the face of another Turk and drew his sword. He slashed at the heads of the men who were trying to pull him down from the saddle and drove Ibrasam back down the passage. She kicked out at the men who stood in her way, clashing her huge yellow teeth, biting all the fingers off one man's hand and crushing another's ribs with a single blow from her forefoot. Then she bounded forward and broke through their ranks. Dorian clung to the pommel of the saddle with his good hand as Ibrasam ran free, following the bends and convulsions of the pass. The bloodthirsty yells of the Turks dwindled behind them. The pass ran a mile or more through the hills, 
a dry water course formed when a softer stratum of rock had been washed out by stormwater over the millennia. Once they were clear of their pursuers, Ibrasam shifted into that smooth-pacing trot that covered the ground swiftly and had given her the name Silk Wind. Dorian fell into a trance from thirst, exhaustion, and the stiffening pain of his wounds. The walls of the pass streamed past him endlessly, mesmerising him further. Once he almost toppled from the saddle, but Ibrasam felt him slump and came to an abrupt halt. This roused Dorian, and he sat more firmly in the saddle when she went on. Only then did he become aware that her gait was hampered, but he was confused and dazed, barely able to keep his seat. The effort required to dismount and check her condition was too much for him. Once again he dozed, and when he started awake, he found that they had emerged from the far end of the pass and were out into the open country of the Awamir. He could tell from the height of the moon and the position of the stars that it was after midnight. The night was icy cold, a cruel contrast to the burning heat of the day. The blood and sweat that soaked his robe chilled him further, and he was shivering and light-headed. Ibrisam was moving strangely under him, her pace short and her back hunched. At last he summoned the strength and resolve to order her to halt and couch. He tested the water-skin that hung over her withers, and found that it contained less than a gallon of the stinking water from Chayil Yayamin. He took his thick woolen shawl out of the carrying net and spread it over his shoulders, Still shivering, he examined Ibrisam to find the cause of her distress. He saw at once that her rump was wet and shining in the moonlight, and discovered that she was scouring heavily. The liquid dung she was passing was dark red with blood. Dorian felt a plunge of dismay. His own injuries and misery forgotten, he palpated her sleek, smooth flanks, but when he touched her belly just forward of her back legs, she moaned softly, and his hand came away wet and shining with blood. A thrust from a Turkish lance had cut deep into her belly and ruptured her bowels. She was mortally wounded, and it was a miracle of love and determination that she had carried him this far. Dorian was so weak and sad that his tears welled. He untied the leather bucket from the load and filled it with the last of the water from the skin. He drank half a pint of the filthy liquid, then went to kneel at Ibrisam's head. My brave darling, he said, and gave her to drink of what remained in the bucket. She sucked up the water eagerly, and when it was finished, she snuffled the bottom. There is nothing more I can do for you, he told her, as he stroked her ears. She loved him to do that. You will be dead by morning, he said, and I with you, unless you can carry me a little further, for the Turks will follow closely. Will you carry me for the last time? He stood up and called to her softly. Hut, hut. She swung her head and looked at him with those great dark eyes swimming with agony. Hut, hut, he said, and she groaned, roared and heaved herself upright. Dorian dragged himself up into the saddle. She went on at that cramped, painful gait, following the tracks that the prince and Batula had left through the broken hills and deep wadis. Dorian almost toppled again, but he rallied and used the empty carrying net to tie himself into the saddle. He dozed, jerked awake, and dozed again, slowly sinking into a coma. He lost all track of time, speed, direction, and they wandered on, the dying beast and the man. An hour after dawn, just as the cruel flail of the sun scourged them once again, Ibrisam went down for the last time. She died on her feet, still trying to struggle forward. With a last low moan, she fell heavily, throwing him from the saddle to sprawl on the rock-strewn earth. Dorian crawled to his knees, then dragged himself into the shade of Ibrisam's carcass. He forced himself not to think about the death of his beloved beast, or the loss of so many of his men. He had to concentrate all his strength and wits on staying alive until Batula could lead the Awamir back to rescue him. 
he saw the heavy tracks of many camels in the loose earth ahead of him, and realised that even in her death throes, Ibrisam had still faithfully followed the route that Batula and the prince had taken towards the oasis at Mukhaid. That might yet save his life, for when they returned they would come back along their own tracks. It was the rule of survival in the desert not to leave a place of safety and wander off into the wilderness. But Dorian knew that the Turks were following him. Zain al-Din would not let him go so easily. The enemy must be close, and if they found him before Batula returned, he could expect the same treatment that Zain had given to the wounded he had captured at the pass of the Bright Gazelle. He must go on to meet Batula and he must try to keep ahead of the following Turks for as long as he had the strength to remain on his feet. He stood up shakily and looked down at the load that Ibrisam had carried. Was there anything that might be of use to him? He unhooked the water skin, shook it, then held it high with both hands, the spout to his lips. A few bitter drops slid reluctantly into his mouth, and he swallowed painfully, his throat already swelling. Then he dropped the empty skin weapons. He looked to what he had with him. There was his jezel in the leather scabbard, and the powder flask and shot bag. The buttstock of the musket was inlaid with ivory and mother of pearl, the lock chased with silver. It weighed almost seven pounds, too heavy to carry. Leave it. His broken lance had been left at the pass, and the sword would weigh him down. Its weight would seem to double with every mile he walked, Sadly, he unbuckled the belt and let it drop. He kept the dagger. He would need that at the end. The edge was keen. He had honed it until he could have shed the red-gold hairs from his own forearm with it. When the Turks closed in, he would fall on it, choosing a clean death rather than emasculation and disembowelment. He looked down at Ibrisam and said, There is one last thing I ask you for, my darling. He knelt beside her and slit open her belly with the dagger. From her stomach he took handfuls of the contents and squeezed out the liquid between his fingers and drank it. It was bitter with gore, and he had to control the urge to vomit it out again, but he knew it would give him the strength to survive a few more hours under the cruel sun. He rebound his wounds, found that the bleeding had stopped and that black scabs had formed. Then he tightened the straps of his sandals and spread the shawl over his head to fend off the brutal sunlight. Without looking back at Ibrisam, he struck out along the tracks of the prince's party towards a horizon that was already wavering with the blue heat mirage. An hour or so later he fell for the first time. His legs seemed to turn to water under him, and he went down face first. His open mouth was filled with dry, chalky earth, and he almost choked as he tried to spit it out. There was no saliva left in his mouth, and the dust was sucked into his lungs as he panted for air. He struggled into a sitting position, coughed and gasped. The effort saved him from sinking into coma. He wiped his face with the tail of his headdress, and there was no spittle on his lips or sweat on his face. He forced himself back onto his feet, though he lurched and staggered, almost fell again, he kept himself upright, and some little strength returned to his legs. He walked on, and the sunlight burned deep into his eyes, seeming to cook the contents of his skull. He felt his dry lips tear like parchment as he tried to swallow, and there was the slow, metallic weep of salty blood into his mouth. The pain and thirst slowly receded, and he entered that dreamlike state where there was no feeling. He heard music, sweet and melodious. He stopped and looked about him blearily, saw Tom and Yasmini standing together on the crest of the slope he was climbing. They were both waving and laughing. Don't be a baby, Dory, Tom shouted. Come on, Dowie, Yasmini danced like a dainty elf beside him, swirling her skirts. He had forgotten how pretty she was. Come with me, Dowie. I will take you down the Angel's Road again. Dorian broke into a shambling, unsteady run, and the pair on the hill turned and waved at him before they disappeared over the crest. He felt as though each pace he took was through deep, loose sand, and he stumbled over a rock, had to windmill his arms to prevent himself falling. But he reached the crest and looked down into the valley beyond. 
He stared in amazement, for the valley was filled with green trees laden with ripe red fruit, and there were fields of lush English grass leading down to a lake of sparkling water. Tom had gone, but Yasmini stood naked at the edge of the lake. Her body was sleek and slim, her skin a lovely golden shade, and her hair with its silver blaze rippled down to her waist. Her little apple-shaped breasts peered shyly through the shimmering curtain of her hair. Dowie, she called, and her voice was as sweet as the dawn call of a desert thrush. Dowie, I have waited for you for so long. He tried to run down to her, but his legs gave way again and he fell. He was too weary to lift his head. Just let me sleep a little, Yassi, he pleaded. But no sound came from his swollen throat, and his tongue seemed to fill his mouth and cleave to the roof. With another huge effort he opened his eyes, and with a terrible sense of loss he realised that Yasmini and the lake were gone. There was only the harsh, burning wilderness below him, rock, thorn, and sand. He rolled over to look back down the hill, and saw the patrol of Ottoman cavalry. They were coursing along his back track, fifty men on racing camels, still two sea miles behind him, but coming on apace. He knew that they, at least were not phantoms. He crawled a short way on hands and knees, then launched himself to his feet. His knees buckled, but he fought off the weakness and staggered over the crest of the hill. The gradient helped him to run on. He heard the music again, but now it filled the heavens. Hundreds of voices were singing. He lifted his eyes and saw the heavenly choir, a throng of angels clustered around the sun, so glorious that they starred his vision like the reflections from the facets of a great diamond. Come to God, they sang. Surrender yourself to the will of God. Yes, he mumbled, and the sound of his own voice was strange in his ears, coming from a great distance. Yes, I am ready. As he said it, a miracle occurred. God appeared to him. God was tall. He wore a robe of blinding white, and the rays of the sun behind his head formed a golden nimbus. His countenance was beautiful, noble, handsome, and filled with great compassion. God lifted his right hand in a gesture of blessing, and his eyes were filled with love as he looked down at Dorian. Dorian felt as though God's strength was flowing into his body, charging his soul with an infinite sense of holiness and reverence. He fell to his knees and used this new strength to shout aloud, I bear witness that there is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. God's beautiful face shone with benevolence. He strode forward, lifted Dorian to his feet, and embraced him, kissed his blackened, bleeding lips. My son, God said. But he spoke with the voice of Prince Abd Muhammad al-Malik. Your acceptance of the one true faith fills my heart with joy. Now the prophecy fulfills itself, and I give thanks to God that we have found you in time. Dorian sagged in the prince's arms, and Al-Malik shouted to the men who followed him closely, Water! Batula! Bring water! Batula squeezed cool, sweet water from a sponge between Dorian's lips and lifted him onto the litter they had prepared for this moment. A dozen men of the Awamir raised it onto the back of one of the baggage camels. High on the swaying litter, Dorian rolled his head, and through bloodshot eyes between swollen lids saw the hordes of the Awamir coming across the plain. Then, on the skyline above, the Turkish patrol appeared and reined in their camels in their own dust cloud. They gazed down in astonishment and sudden trepidation on the army of the Awamir. A great shout of Allah Akbar went up from the ranks of the Awamir. They couched their long lances and swept forward to battle. The Turks turned and fled before them. Dorian sagged back on the litter, closed his eyes, and let the darkness overwhelm him. There were almost 6,000 fighting men in the column of Awamir that streamed back through the pass of the Bright Gazelle. The salt flats beyond the pass were clear of the enemy. Their scouts had reported the approach of the prince's army, and they had fled back into the north towards Muscat. Al-Malik 
paused at the pass to give decent burial to the broken bodies of the Tsar who had died there. Dorian was still too weak and sick to rise from his litter, but he had Batula and four others carry him to the graveside, and for the first time he prayed as a Muslim in the community of other believers as they recited the prayer for the dead. Then the army went on across the salt flats to the bitter wells at Chayel Yayamin, where the warriors of the Tsar had already assembled, adding another three thousand lances to the prince's array. The sheikhs of the Tsar came to the tent where Dorian lay that night, crowded around his litter, and demanded that he tell them every detail of the fight at the pass of the bright gazelle. They interrupted the recitation with exclamations of wonder as he told them how each of the Tsar had died the fathers and brothers of the dead men weeping with pride. By Allah, a fight in which Hassan would have been happy to die. In God's name, Salim was a man. Allah will prepare a place in paradise for my son Mustafa. They were fierce for war and revenge, for the blood feud could be settled only in blood, and they spat in the sand and swore their oaths of retribution against Zain al-Din and the Turks. In his heart, Dorian swore the same oaths with them. Then, each noon and evening that the army camped at Chayel Yayamin, they came again to his tent to hear the story repeated, and they corrected Dorian if he left out a single detail, pleading with him to remember every blow and shot and exactly what each of the Tsar had done and said before he died. From Chayel Yayamin, the army set out north on the next leg of the long journey to Muscat, at each well and pass through the mountains, the other tribes came to join them, the Balhaf and the Afar and the Bait, Kater and the Harasis, so that by the time they reached Mukaibara, there were 15,000 lances together, a mighty host that spread back ten miles across the desert. Batula whispered the story of Dorian's conversion to one of his companions. No Arab could keep a secret. Certainly not one as poignant as this, and the tale was told around every campfire, and the warriors repeated the prophecy of the ancient Saint Tain Tain, for many had read the text of it on the walls of his tomb. They debated it endlessly, and swore in God's name that Al-Salil was verily the orphan of the prophecy, and that with him in their company the victory was assured. Before Ramadan came again, they would install Prince Abd Muhammad al-Malik, on the elephant throne in the halls of Muscat. In the weeks that it took the army to travel from Chayel Yayamin to Mukaye Bara, Dorian's injuries healed cleanly, for in the desert there are no evil humours to make wounds corrupt and mortify. When he was ready to take his place in the ranks once more, the prince sent for him. As he strode through the encampment, every tribe cheered him and followed him to the tent of the prince. They massed around the open doorway as Dorian knelt before Al-Malik and asked of him, Give me your blessing, father. You have my gratitude and my blessing, son, and much more besides. Al-Malik clapped his hands, and Batula led forward four beautiful thoroughbred racing camels. Each was richly caparisoned and carried lance, sword and jezel in the scabbards on their backs. This is my gift to you to repay in small coin what you lost at the pass of the bright gazelle. I thank you for your generosity, father, though I look for no reward for what was only my duty. Al-Malik clapped his hands again, and two heavily veiled old women of the Tsar came to Dorian and laid a bundle of folded silk at his feet. These are the mothers of Hassan and Salim who died at the pass, the prince explained. They have begged me for the honour of sowing and embroidering your battle pennant. The women spread out the banner upon the floor of the tent. It was six feet long, of azure blue silk, and embroidered upon it in silver metal thread was the prophecy of St. Taim Taim. The elegant script flowed and swirled upon the silken ground, like the currents and whirlpools in the surface of a swift blue river. Father, this is the pennant of a sheikh, Dorian protested. And that is what you are now. Al-Malik smiled fondly at him. I have raised you to that rank. I know that you will bear it with honour. Dorian stood up and held the banner high above his head, then ran with it out into the sunlight. 
The crowds opened before him, shouted their acclamation and fired their muskets in the air. The banner streamed out behind Dorian like a blue serpent on the wind. He came back to the prince's tent and prostrated himself before him. You do me too much honour, lord. In the coming battle you shall command the left flank, Sheikh al-Salil, the prince told him. I shall place four thousand lances under your pennant. Dorian sat up and looked gravely into the prince's eyes. Father, may I speak to you in secrecy? Al-Malik gestured for the leather sides of the tent to be lowered, for Al-Alama and his retinue to retire and leave the two of them together. What more do you ask of me, my son? Al-Malik leaned closer to him. Speak, and you shall have it. In reply, Dorian spread the azure banner and traced with his finger the words of the prophecy. He shall bring together the sands of the desert which are divided, he read aloud. Continue, the prince ordered, frowning. I do not know your meaning. It seems that the holy saint placed a further duty upon me. It comes to me that when he speaks of the sands of the desert, the saint was speaking of the tribes who are divided and at war with each other. Now the prince nodded. This may well be true, he admitted. Although most of the tribes have come to us, the Masakara, the Hat, and the Bani Buhassan, will beat the war drum for Yakub and the sublime port. Let me go to them under this banner, Dorian pleaded. Let them see the colour of my hair, and I shall debate the prophecy with them. Then, if Allah is kind, I shall bring over another ten thousand lances to your side. No, Al-Malik started up in alarm. The Masakara are treacherous. They will disembowel you and peg you out in the sun. I cannot allow you to run such a risk. I have fought against them, Dorian said softly. They must accord me the respect of an honourable foe. If I came to them alone and placed myself in their power as a traveller, then they dare not go against the teachings of the prophet. They must listen to what I have to say to them. The prince looked unhappy and stroked his beard in agitation. But what Dorian had said was true. The prophet had placed a duty of host on his believers. They were obliged to protect the traveller in their midst. Still, I cannot allow you to place yourself in such jeopardy, he said at last. Dorian argued. One life at risk, but ten thousand lances as the stake. Father, you cannot deny me this chance to fulfil my destiny as it is written. At last the prince sighed. How can the Masakara prevail against your eloquence? I cannot. You may go to them, El Salil, as my emissary. But I swear on the red beard of the prophet that if they harm you in any way, there will be such a lopping of heads as will gorge every vulture in Araby until they cannot fly. At sunset the following evening, the prince sat alone on a rock on the crest of a low hill beyond the oasis. Four camels slipped out of the encampment of the army and rode past his hilltop, heading northwards into the purple shadows. Dorian rode the first, leading the second on a long rein. Batula followed him, also leading a second camel. Both men were veiled. When he looked up at the prince, Dorian dipped his lance in salute, and the prince lifted his right hand in blessing. Then Abd Muhammad al-Malik watched them ride away into the wilderness, his expression sad and bereft. It was dark, and the stars were a blaze of glory overhead, when at last he rose from the rock on which he was sitting, and went down towards the glow of the campfires that filled the wide valley of Mukai Ibarra. In the cool season, when the winds came off the sea, in the months before the feast of Ramadan, the army of Al-Malik lay before Muscat and watched the Ottoman and the host of tribes loyal to the Caliph come out in battle array to meet them. Al-Malik sat with his staff under a leather awning on a promontory that jutted out into the plain, his own army drawn up beneath him. He raised the long brass telescope to his eye and studied the formations of the enemy as they evolved before him. 
The Turks were in the centre, their cavalry squadrons in the van, and their camel men behind them. How many? he asked the men around him, who argued as though they were counting goats at a market. Twelve thousand Turks, they decided at last. The centre glittered with bronze and steel. The green banners of the sublime port waved and flapped in the sea breeze. The cavalry squadrons cantered forward, then settled into a solid phalanx, ready to advance to the attack. And the Masakara? the prince asked. How many? They were on the right flank, a milling throng of camel men, restless as a flock of starlings. Six, seven thousand said a sheikh of the Harassis. At least that many, said another, perhaps more. Al-Malik looked to the other flank of the enemy, where the black veils and headdresses marked them as the Bani Buhassan and the Hart. They were the wolves of the desert, and there were as many of them as there were of the Masakara. Al-Malik tasted once again the bitter gall of disappointment in the back of his throat. They were outnumbered almost two to one. Al-Salil had failed in his attempt to bring over the northern tribes. Al-Malik had heard nothing of him since he had vanished into the desert almost two moons ago. He knew in his heart that they had miscalculated, that he should never have sent Al-Salil to them. Every day he had dreaded receiving a gift from the Masakara, the severed head of his red-haired son in a leather bag. Although the grisly trophy had not arrived, the proof of his failure was out on the plain. Almost 15,000 rebel lances drawn up against him. Suddenly there was a disturbance along the centre of the Turkish line. Dispatch riders galloped forward with orders from the Ottoman staff, and the horns sounded the advance. The Turkish cavalry moved forward, rank upon rank, rippling with sunlight off their accoutrements, but the Arab formations on the flanks held their positions and allowed gaps to open in the front. This was unusual, and through his telescope the prince watched with a sudden keener interest. There was another commotion among the enemy, and this time the staff gallopers sped out from the Turkish command in the centre, waving their arms, clearly urging their Arab allies to join in the general advance and close the dangerous gaps in the front. Then, at last, the Arab formations began to move. But they wheeled right and left towards the centre, where the Turks stood uncertainly confused by this unexpected evolution. In the sweet name of God, whispered Al-Malik, and he felt his heart swell so that his breath came short. In the centre of the front rank of the Masakara, he saw a strange new banner unfurl, carried by a tall rider on a honey-coloured thoroughbred camel. He turned his glass upon this warrior and saw that the banner was Asia Blue, shot through with gleaming silver script, and as he stared in wonder, the rider threw off his headdress and couched his lance. His hair was red gold, and his lance was aimed at the Turkish flank. Allah! All praise to Allah, Al-Salil has done it. He has turned the rebel tribes to our cause. As he stared in wonder, the Arab formations on either flank of the Turks started forward, catching the Ottoman in enfilade, closing upon them like a fist of steel. The prince roused himself, gave the order, Advance! Charge at them! The war drums boomed and the horns sounded an urgent strident note. With the Tsar and the Awamir in the centre, the army of the south rolled forward, raising a towering cloud of dust to sully the high blue sky. Dorian rode in the centre of the line, and his heart was singing. Right up to this last moment, he had not been certain that the sheikhs of the Masakara would hold true to their undertaking to turn upon the Ottoman. The fleet beast under him pulled ahead of the riders on each side of him, and only Batula could match him, riding hard a lance length behind. Ahead, the Turks were in confusion, most still looking down the valley to where Prince al-Malik's army was rolling forward. Only those closest to the right flank had seen the danger and were turning to meet the charge. With a clash and shock of body to body and shield to shield, they struck the Ottoman flank and ripped through it. Dorian selected a man from the ranks, bulky in his chain mail and bronze helmet. 
dark face contorted with rage and dismay as he struggled to control his plunging steed. Dorian dropped the tip of his lance and leaned low in the saddle. Under Batula's training, he had learned to pick a thrown desert melon out of the air at full gallop. Now he aimed for the opening in the Turk's chainmail shirt into his left armpit. The lance jolted in his hand as the tip found the opening unerringly and slipped through the man's chest until it struck the chainmail on the far side. Then the impact lifted the Turk clean out of the saddle, and he hung on the supple lance, kicking. Dorian dropped the tip and let him slide off the steel and roll in the dust. Then he raised the lance again and picked out his next victim. This time the lance shattered in his hand at the force of the blow but the steel head was firmly lodged in the throat of the man he had hit. The Turk gripped the stump with both hands and tried to pluck it out of his flesh, but he died before he could do so, then slipped down from the saddle to be dragged away by his fear-crazed horse. Batula tossed the spare lance to Dorian, who caught it neatly, and in the same movement couched the long shaft and dropped its bright head to the level of the next man's belly. In the first few minutes of the charge, the ranks of the Ottoman were ripped wide open, charged from both flanks, and while they still reeled, the main army of the south crashed into their disordered front. The locked armies revolved like a mass of debris caught up in the vortex of a whirlpool, and the uproar was deafening as men hacked and shoved, shouted, and died. It could not last long, for the conflict was one-sided, and the fury of the attackers too fierce. Caught in flank and front, outnumbered at every point, the Ottoman line bulged and began to give. The Arabs sensed the victory and pressed forward, like wolves around a dying camel, tearing, howling, ripping into them, until at last they broke, and the battle turned into a bloody broken shambles. Dorian's first charge had carried him deep into the mass of the enemy, and for a desperate while he and Batula were cut off and surrounded. The second lance broke in his hands, so he drew out his sword and fought until his right arm was daubed with Turkish blood to the shoulder. Then abruptly the fury of the enemy around him abated, and they broke away, turning the heads of their mounts towards the rear. Dorian saw men throw down their weapons as the Arabs came racing through the gaps in their front. The Turks whipped their mounts into a gallop and fled. Full chase, Dorian yelled. Chase them, cut them down. Mingled like oil and water, the two armies streamed back across the plain together. The Arabs were ululating and swinging their bloody swords, shouting their war cries as the battle turned into a rout and the fleeing Turks made little effort to defend themselves. Some threw themselves from their horses and knelt in the path of the attackers, begging for mercy. But the Arabs lanced them casually as they rode by, then wheeled back to strip the corpses of gold and booty. Dorian fought his way through to the rear. Ahead he saw that the Ottoman staff had long ago abandoned the battle, and were also in desperate flight across the plain. The general and every one of his officers had grabbed a horse or a camel and were fleeing back towards the city. In all this multitude, there was only one man Dorian wanted. "'Where is Zain al-Din?' he shouted to Batula. Dorian had seen him earlier that morning as the army had debauched through the gates of Muscat. Zain al-Din had been with the Turkish staff, riding behind the Ottoman general, wearing half-armour and carrying a lance as though he were eager for the fight. With him had been Abu Bakr, his old crony and henchman from the Zenana at Lamu. Abu Bakr had grown tall and lean, with long moustaches, and he also was dressed in the accoutrement of a warrior. Although his two old enemies had ridden within two lance lengths of Dorian, neither had recognised him among the ranks of the Masakara, for Dorian had been mounted on a strange camel, and his face and red hair had been swathed in the folds of a black turban. "'Where is he?' he shouted to Batula. Can you see him? He jumped up and stood tall on the wooden saddle frame of the running camel, a careless feat of skill, and from the height he scoured the open plain ahead, which was covered not only with the fleeing enemy, but also with bolting loose horses and unmounted camels whose riders had been hacked down. There he is, Dorian shouted, dropped back easily into the saddle and urged his mount forward. Zain al-Din was half a mile ahead, 
mounted on the same bay stallion that Dorian had seen that morning. His plump body was unmistakable, as was the golden head rope around his blue headdress. Dorian pushed his camel to the top of its speed. He overhauled and passed many other Turks, some high-ranking officers, but he ignored them, and like a cheetah coursing the gazelle of his choice, bore down swiftly on Zain al-Din. Brother, he called to him as he ran close behind the bay stallion, stay a while, I have something for you. Zayn looked back over his shoulder. The wind plucked off his headdress and his long dark hair and his beard fluttered. Terror turned his face the colour of rancid camel butter as he saw Dorian close behind him, saw the long curved sword in his hand, his face all speckled with other men's blood, his grin savage and merciless. Zayn al-Din seemed paralysed with fear. Clinging to the pommel of his saddle, his eyes fixed on Dorian as he came alongside and raised the scimitar on high. Then, with a shriek, Zayn released his grip and fell out of the saddle. He struck the hard ground and rolled like a boulder down a steep hillside until he lay still at last in a dusty heap like a pile of old clothing. Dorian wheeled his camel and stood over him as Zayn crawled up onto his knees. His face was white with dust, and there was a raw graze down one cheek. He looked up at Dorian and began to blubber. Spare me, Al-Salil. I will give you anything. Throw me your lance, Dorian called to Batula, without taking his eyes off Zayn's abject face. Batula tossed it across to him. Dorian lowered the point and placed it on Zayn's chest. Zayn began to weep, and the tears cut runnels through the dust that powdered his face. I have a luck of gold rupees, my brother. It is all yours if you spare me, I swear it. His mouth was slack, and his lips quivered and drooled with fear. Do you remember Hassan at the pass of the bright gazelle? Dorian asked grimly, leaning out from the saddle to stare into his face. God forgive me, Zain cried. It was in the heat of the fighting I was not myself. Forgive me, my brother. I wish only that I could bring myself to touch you. Then surely I would cut out your testicles, as you did to my friend. But rather would I touch a poisonous snake. Dorian spat with disgust. You do not deserve the warrior's death by the steel of the lance. But because I am a compassionate man, I shall give it to you. He pressed forward with the long shaft, and the bright point pricked Zain al-Din's fat chest. Then Zain saved his own life. He found the only words that could avert Dorian's implacable wrath. In the name of the man who is our father, in the love of Al-Malik, grant me mercy. Dorian's expression changed. His gaze wavered, and he withdrew the lance tip an inch. You ask for the judgment of the father you have betrayed? We both know it must be the garot of the executioner. If that is the death you choose, over the clean death I offer you, so be it then. I grant it to you. Dorian put up the lance and rammed the butt down into the leather bucket behind his heel. Batula, he called, and when his lance-bearer came up, he ordered him, bind the arms of this eater of swine flesh behind his back and place a noose around his neck. Batula slipped down from the saddle and swiftly trussed Zain's arms, then dropped a running noose over his head. He passed the end of the rope up to Dorian, who made it fast to one of the loops on his saddle. "'On your feet!' Dorian barked, and gave the rope a yank. "'I am taking you to the prince!' Zayn lurched upright, then staggered after Dorian's camel. Once he lost his balance and rolled on the ground, but Dorian did not slacken the pace or even look back, and Zayn struggled up again, his robe ripped and his knees bloody. Before they had covered a mile of that sanguinary plain, on which the corpses of the Turks lay like seaweed on a storm-lashed beach, the golden sandals had been torn from Zayn's feet, and his soles were raw. His face was swollen and black, as the rope half choked him, and he was so weak he could no longer call for mercy. As Prince Abd Muhammad al-Malik rode up to the gates of Muscat at the head of his retinue, the citizens of the city and the courtiers of the Caliph al uzza ibn Yaqub threw open the gates and came out to greet him. 
They had torn their garments and poured ash and dust over their heads as a sign of repentance, and they knelt in front of his horse, pleading for their lives, swearing allegiance to him and hailing him as the new caliph of Oman. The prince sat impassively on his horse, a noble magisterial figure, but when the vizier of his brother Yaqub came forward, bearing a stained sack over his shoulder, Al-Malik's expression turned to sorrow, for he knew what it contained. The vizier emptied the sack into the dust of the roadway, and Yaqub's severed head rolled to the feet of the prince's mount and stared up at him with dull, glazed eyes. His grey beard was matted and filthy, like that of a street beggar, and the flies settled in a humming cloud on his open eyes and bloody lips. Al-Malik gazed down on him sadly, then looked up at the vizier and spoke softly. "'You seek to win my approval by murdering my brother and bringing me this sad, broken thing?' he asked. "'Great Lord, I did only what I thought would please you,' the vizier blanched and trembled. The prince gestured to the sheikh of the Awamir at his side. "'Kill him!' The sheikh leaned from the saddle and, with his sword, split the vizier's scowl down to the chin. "'Treat my brother's remains with all respect and prepare him for burial before the setting of the sun. I shall lead the prayers for his soul, said Al-Malik. Then he looked at the cringing citizens of Muscat. Your city is now my city. Its people are now my people, he told them. By my royal decree, Muscat is exempt from plunder. Its women are protected by my word of honour from rape and its treasure from pillage. He lifted his right hand in blessing and said, after you have sworn the oath of fealty, all your trespasses and crimes against me shall be forgiven and forgotten. Then he rode on into the city, to the halls of Muscat, and took his place upon the elephant throne of Oman, carved from great ivory tusks. A hundred noblemen clamoured for the new caliph's ear, and a hundred pressing affairs of state awaited his attention. But one of the first men for whom he sent was Sheikh al-Salil. When Dorian prostrated himself before the throne, al-Malik stepped down, lifted him to his feet, and embraced him. I had thought you dead, my son. Then when I saw your banner flying in the ranks of the Masakara, my heart shouted aloud with joy. I owe you much. I shall never know just how much, for if you had not brought in the northern tribes under my flag... The battle might have gone hard for us. Perhaps I might not be sitting on the elephant throne this day. Father, during the battle I took a prisoner from the army of the Ottoman, Dorian told him, and made a sign to Batula, who waited among the noblemen at the back of the throne room. He came forward, leading Zain al-Din on the rope. Zayn's attire was ragged and filthy with dust and dried blood, his hair and beard white with dust, and his bare feet raw and bloodied like those of a pilgrim. At first Al-Malik did not recognize him. Then Zayn stumbled forward and threw himself at his father's feet, and wept and wriggled his whole body like a whipped dog. Father, forgive me, forgive my stupidity. I am guilty of treason and disrespect. I am guilty of greed. I was led astray by evil men. How is this so? the caliph asked coldly. The sublime port offered me the elephant throne if I would turn against you, and I was weak and stupid. I regret this with all my heart, and if you should order me killed, I will shout my love for you to the heavens as the life flies from my body. You richly deserve such a death, the caliph said. You have had nothing but love and kindness from me all your life, and you have repaid me with treachery and dishonor. Allow me another chance to prove my love to you, Zain slobbered on his father's sandals, and mucus streamed from his nose as the tears poured from his eyes. This glad day has already been marred by the death of my brother, Yakub. There has been enough blood spilled, said Al-Malik thoughtfully. Stand up, Zain al-Din. I grant you pardon, but in penance you must make the pilgrimage to the holy places at Mecca and ask forgiveness there also. Do not show me your face again until you return with your soul cleansed. Zayn lumbered to his feet. 
all Allah's blessing upon you, Majesty, for your benevolence and your compassion. You shall find my love to be like a mighty river that flows on eternally. Still groveling, bowing, and mouthing protestations of loyalty and duty, Zayn backed away down the length of the throne room, then turned and pushed his way through the crowds and out of the tall carved ivory doors. Ten days after the triumphal entry into Muscat, and a week before the commencement of Ramadan, the coronation of the new caliph was celebrated in the halls of Muscat and the streets of the city. Most of the tribal warriors had drifted back into the wilderness to their villages around the tiny oases scattered down the length of Oman, for they were desert dwellers and unhappy behind the walls of a city. They swore their oaths of fealty to Al-Malik, then rode away on their camels laden with the spoils of the Ottoman army that they had destroyed. Those who remained joined the celebrations in the streets of the city, where whole carcasses of camels and sheep were roasted on the bonfires in every souk and square. The ram's horn sounded, the drums beat, and men danced in the street while veiled women watched from the upper floors of the huddled buildings. The new caliph walked in procession through the crowded streets, stopping every few paces to embrace one of the warriors who had fought in his army. The crowds ululated, fired joy shots in the air, and fell at his feet. It was well after midnight when the caliph returned to the palace of Muscat, and Sheikh al-Salil was still at his side where he had been all that day. "'Stay with me yet a while,' the caliph ordered, when they reached the door of his bedchamber. He took Dorian's arm and led him through and out onto the high balcony which overlooked the sea and the streets of the city. The music and the shouts of the revellers carried faintly up to them, and the flames of the bonfires reflected off the walls and lit the dancers. "'I owe you an explanation for pardoning Zain al-Din,' said the caliph at last. "'You owe me nothing, Majesty,' Dorian protested. "'It is I who owe you everything.' Zayn deserved a harsher punishment. He was a traitor, and I know how he treated your comrades at the pass of the Bright Gazelle. My concerns are nothing, Dorian replied. It is what he did to you, and what he will one day do to you again, that angers me. You think that his repentance was a sham? He lusts for the elephant throne, said Dorian. I would have been happier if you had taken a scorpion into your bosom, and a cobra into your bed. The caliph sighed sadly. He is my eldest son. I could not begin my reign with his murder. But I have placed you in great jeopardy, for his hatred of you is implacable. I am able to defend myself, father. That you have proved, the caliph laughed softly. <laughs> but now to other matters. I have another task for you. A dangerous and difficult one. You have only to command me, Majesty. Our trade with the African interior is most important to the prosperity of our people. We, who once were only poor desert nomads, are becoming a nation of seafarers and traders. I understand that, Father. Today I received a message from the Sultan of Zanzibar. Our African trade is under a new and grave threat. The very existence of our bases at Zanzibar and Lamu is at stake. How is this possible? A band of marauders is savaging our caravan routes between the Fever Coast and the Great Lakes. Our African trade is in jeopardy. Are the black tribes rising in rebellion? Dorian asked. Perhaps this is the case. We know that there are black tribesmen among the marauders, but there are also rumours that they are led by infidel Franks. From which country? Dorian asked. The caliph shrugged. This is not known. All that is certain is that they are ruthless in their attacks upon our slave caravans. We have lost almost the entire year's revenue from the sale of slaves, together with immense quantities of ivory and gold out of the interior. What do you want me to do? Dorian asked. I will give you a firman of authority, a commission as a general in my armies, and as many fighting men as you need, a thousand, two thousand. I want you to sail south to Lamu, 
then cross the channel and march inland to put an end to these depredations. When do you wish me to leave? You must sail with the new moon that ends the fast of Ramadan. The flotilla of Sheikh al-Salil, the drawn sword, anchored off the beach of the island of Lamu in the full of the moon. It comprised seven large seagoing dows carrying 1,200 troops of the caliphate. Dorian went ashore in the dawn to call upon the governor, to present his firman and to make arrangements for the reception and resupply of his army. He needed quarters for his men ashore to recuperate from the long voyage down the coast and supplies of fresh food, horses and baggage animals. The camels of the desert would not survive long in the humid, pestilent coast, and neither would Arabian horses from the north. Dorian needed animals that had been reared on the coast and had developed an immunity to the African diseases. It took three days to get all his men and his baggage train ashore, and Dorian spent much of this time at the landing or in the newly built camp above the beach. On the evening of the third day he was walking back through the streets of the town accompanied by Batula and three of his captains. They were almost at the gates of the fort when he heard his childhood name called al abkhara he spun round, for he recognised the voice, though he had not heard it in many years, and stared at the heavily veiled woman who crouched in the doorway of the old mosque across the narrow lane. Tahi? Is that you, old mother? Praise be to God, my child. I thought you might not remember me. Dorian wanted to rush to her and embrace her, but it would be a grave breach of decorum and etiquette to do so in a public place. Stay there and I will send someone to bring you to my quarters, he told her, and walked on. He sent Batula back to bring her through the gates of the fort to the wing that the governor had placed at his disposal. As soon as Tahi stepped through the door, she threw back her veil and rushed to him. She was weeping almost incoherently. My little boy, my baby, how tall you have grown! The beard and the fierce eyes, like a falcon! But I would have known you anywhere! What a great man you have become, and a sheikh also. Dorian laughed, held her, and stroked her hair. What is this silver I see here, O oh mother? But you are still beautiful. I am an old woman, but your embrace makes me young again. Sit down. He led her to the pile of rugs on the terrace, then sent a slave for sherbet and a platter of honeyed dates. There is so much I want to hear from you. She reached across to stroke his beard and his cheek. My beautiful baby, who has become a beautiful man, tell me everything you have done since you left Lamu. That would take a day and a night, he protested, smiling fondly at the old woman. I have the rest of my life to listen, she said. So he answered all her questions, in the meantime holding back his own, although it took all his restraint. At last he came to the end of the recital. And thus the caliph has sent me back to Lamu and the fever coast, and I praise God that he has, for now, I am able to look on your beloved face again. Her face was deeply lined with care and hardship, and her hair steely grey, but he loved her as much as he ever had. Tell me, how have you fared since I went away? She told him how she had stayed on in the Zenana, given menial duties by the head eunuch Kush. At least I have had shelter and food in my mouth. For that I praise God's name. You shall come to live with me now, he promised her, and I shall be able to repay all the love and kindness that you lavished upon me. She wept again with happiness. Then, trying to make it sound casual, he asked the question and waited for the answer he dreaded. What news of little Yasmini? She must be a woman by now and long ago have been sent to India to marry her mogul princeling. He died of the cholera before she could go to him, Tahi said, and watched his face shrewdly. He tried to disguise his feelings from her, and sipped at the cup of sherbet. So they found another noble and important husband for her? he asked softly. Yes, Tahi agreed. The emir of the Al-Bilkail in Abu Dhabi. A rich old man with fifty concubines, but only three wives, the eldest having died two years ago. She saw the hurt and resignation in his green eyes. When was she married? he asked. 
She had to take pity on him. She is betrothed, but not yet married. She will sail to meet her bridegroom when the winds change and the kuzi blows again. In the meantime, she waits sadly in the Zenana here on Lamu. Yasmini is still here on Lamu? He stared at her. I did not know. I was with her in the garden by the fountain this morning. She knows you are here. Everyone in the Zanana knows it. You should have seen Yasmini's eyes when she spoke your name. They glowed like the stars of the Great Cross. She said, I love Al-Amkhara as a brother and more. I must see him one last time before I become an old man's bride and disappear from the world forever. Dorian jumped up from the rug and strode to the end of the terrace. He stood there gazing over the bay where his dows rode at anchor. He felt a strange sense of elation, as though the wheel of his destiny had made another turn. During the hard years in the desert, his memories of Yasmini had grown dim, but he had refused the offers of the sheikhs of the Tsar to find him a wife from among their own daughters. He had not known until now that he had been waiting for something or someone else, for the memory of the little monkey-faced girl with the mischievous smile. Then he felt a touch of dismay. There was so much that stood in their way. She was imprisoned in the Zenana and betrothed to another man. In the eyes of Allah she was his sister, and he knew that the penalty for incest was a hideous death. If he violated a royal virgin and defiled the sanctity of the Zenana, even the caliph could not save him from death by stoning or decapitation. And what would they do to Yasmini? He shuddered as he remembered the tales, repeated in whispers, of Kush's treatment of any of his charges who strayed. They said that one girl had taken four days to die, and that her screams had prevented anyone in the Zanana from sleeping during all that harrowing time. They cannot let her take the risk, he said aloud, and hugged shoulders torn by emotions that swung him first one way, then the other. And yet I cannot resist my heart's urging. He turned and smashed his bunched fist into the wall of rough coral and reveled in the pain. What shall I do? He strode back to where Tahi squatted patiently on the rug. Will you take a message back to her? You know I will. What shall I tell her, my son? Tell her that at moonrise tonight I will be waiting at the end of the Angel's Road. He would not let Batula accompany him, but at nightfall he took a horse and, heavily robed and veiled, rode out of the town towards the north. He remembered every track, stream, clump of forest and stretch of mangrove swamp. He circled back through the palm groves and saw the walls of the Zenana ahead, tall, massive and dark before the moonrise. He found the old ruin and tethered his mare in a patch of bush nearby, where she would be hidden from anyone using the woodcutter's track. He did not expect any islander to be abroad at this hour, for they were superstitious and terrified of the forest jinns. He climbed over the piles of fallen masonry and pushed his way through the thicket of bush and scrub until he stepped down into the hidden saucer in the centre. The entrance to the tunnel was overgrown, and he could see that no one had used it in all the years that had passed. He found a seat on a block of coral, where he could watch both the entrance to the tunnel and keep an eye open for intruders. He did not have long to wait, for soon the moon glow filled the eastern sky, and then, as it rose above the tops of the palms, it struck down into the saucer with a silver light. He heard a soft sound, light footsteps, and a whisper from the entrance of the tunnel. Dowie, are you there? Her voice was more husky than he remembered, and goose pimples rose along his forearms, "'stirred the fine hairs at the back of his neck. "'I am here, Yassi. I 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 am here, Yassi. 
Track 15. The branches that screened the entrance to the tunnel parted, and Yasmini stepped out into the moonlight. She wore a simple white robe and a cloth over her head. He saw at once that she had grown inches taller, but her body was still slim and supple as a vine, her step quick and alert as a frightened gazelle. She saw him and stopped dead, then slowly reached up and drew aside the veil that covered her face. He gasped. In the moonlight she was beautiful. Although no longer a child, her face was delicate and still elfin in quality, with high cheekbones and huge dark eyes. When she smiled, her lips were full, her teeth white and even. He stood up and pulled back his own veil. She started. You have grown so tall, and the beard, she broke off and stood, uncertain. And you have grown into a lovely woman. Oh, I have missed you so, she whispered, every single day. Suddenly she ran to him, and he held out his arms. She was trembling and sobbing softly against his chest. Don't cry, Yassi, please don't cry. I am so happy, she sobbed. I have never been so happy in all my life. He drew her down on the coral block, and she stopped weeping, pulled back at arm's length to gaze into her face. I have heard news of you even in the Zanana, how you have become a mighty warrior, how you won a great fight in the desert, and rode with our father to Muscat, and won another fierce battle there. Not single-handed, he smiled and traced the line of her mouth with his fingertip. They talked quickly and eagerly, breaking in upon each other and leaving much only half said before flitting on to another idea. What happened to your pet monkey, Ginny? he asked. Tears welled up into her eyes, sparkling in the moonlight. Ginny is dead, she whispered. Cush found him in his precious garden and beat him to death with a spade. He sent his little body to me as a gift. Dorian changed the subject then, distracting her with other more pleasant childhood memories, and soon she was laughing again. Then they both fell silent, and she lowered her eyes shyly. Without looking at him, she whispered, Do you remember how you took me to swim in the sea when we were children? That was the first time I ever remember leaving the Zenana. I remember. His voice was gruff. Will you take me again tonight? She looked up at him. Please, Dowie. They went down through the trees, hand in hand, and found the beach deserted and glistening in the moonlight. The shadows of the palms were purple-black on the sands, and the water shone with the oily luminescence of a black pearl. Since last they had been here, the cave in the sandstone had been excavated deeper by the wave action of the high tides. They paused at the entrance and turned to each other, is what we are doing a sin? she asked him. If it is, I do not care, he replied. I know only that I love you, and that being with you does not feel to me like a sin. I love you also, she said. I could not love anyone or anything more, though I live a hundred years. She untied the ribbon at her neck and let her shift drop onto the sand. She wore only pantaloons of silk. Dorian could not breathe as he gazed at her. Her breasts had swelled, and the tips were dark and pointed. Her skin was smooth and gleamed, like the lining of an oyster shell. You used to tease me that I looked like a monkey, she said, half defiant and half timid, fearing his rejection. Not any more, he had caught his breath. I have never seen anything more beautiful. I was so afraid I would not please you. I want you to like me, Dowie. Tell me that you like me, please. I love you, he said. I want you to be my woman and my wife. She laughed with joy, took his hands and placed them on her breasts. They were warm and pliant, and the nipples hardened as he rolled them gently between his fingers. I am your woman. I think I have always been your woman. I do not know how it is done, but I want to be your wife here tonight. Are you sure, my darling? 
If others learned of this, it could mean disgrace and a terrible death. To be without you would be a death far worse than anything that even Cush could contrive. I know that it cannot be forever. But give me this one night to be your wife. Show me how, Dowie, please. Show me how. So he spread his robes on the sand and laid her down upon them. And slowly, with infinite gentleness, small sounds of love and wonder, gasps of surprise, and in the end, a single long, shuddering spasm of pain that was soon lost in the transport of joy that followed. They became lovers. Over the days that followed, Dorian was embroiled in the planning of his coming campaign on the mainland across the Channel. He purchased most of the draft animals and horses that were available on Lamu and sent one of his captains with three dows south to Zanzibar to do the same thing there. He also bought up much of the available grain stocks and trade goods in the markets. Then he spent hours each day talking to the caravan masters and the Arab traders who had been in the caravans the marauders had attacked and looted. He tried to find out the identity of the bandits, their numbers, how they were armed and the methods they used to carry out the attacks. He tallied the losses these men had suffered and the totals shocked him. Over three lucks of gold dust had been stolen over 27 tons of new ivory and almost 15,000 freshly captured slaves. The caliph had every reason to be worried. As to the marauders themselves, the reports were vague and contradictory. Some said they were white men, Franks, with black archers and spearmen. Others said that they were but savages who fought with spear and arrow. One said that they carried out their raids only during the night when the caravans were encamped, Another told how they ambushed his long files of slaves and porters during the day and murdered all the Arab escorts, and that he alone escaped. Another merchant told how they had spared him and all his men and set them free after stripping them of all their possessions. Dorian realised that there was no agreement as to who they were and no clear pattern as to their methods. Only one thing was clear. The marauders appeared like forest gins out of the southern wilderness and disappeared back the same way. "'What do they do with the slaves they capture?' he asked, and the Arabs shrugged. "'They must sell them somewhere,' he insisted. "'They would need a fleet of large ships to transport such numbers. "'There has been no sighting of such a fleet along the Fever Coast,' they told him. And Dorian's puzzlement increased. He had so little certain information on which he could base his plans. All he could concentrate on was protecting the caravans and getting them moving again, for the trade had almost dried up. Faced with such heavy losses, few of the Arab merchants on Lamu and Zanzibar would take the risk of financing further expeditions. His other planning revolved around taking the war to the bandits, following them into their fastnesses, tracking them down like the wild animals they were, and destroying them. For this purpose, he recruited all the scouts and caravan guides who had been left idle by the cessation of the trade. He could not begin the campaign until the weather on the mainland changed, for this was the season of the big wet, when the coastal lowlands were inundated with the rains and the fever coast lived up to its fearsome reputation. However, he must be ready to sail as soon as the rain ceased and the koozie wind started to blow again. Thinking of the start of the koozie, always brought his mind back to Yasmini. That same wind would carry her ship north to the gulf and her marriage. The thought made his gut sour with anger and frustration. He thought of writing to the caliph in Muscat and asking him to cancel the marriage plans. He even considered confessing his love to his adoptive father and asking him for dispensation to marry Yasmini. They met each evening after dark. But when he broached this idea to her, Yasmini was terrified and trembled with fear. I think not about myself, Dowie, but if our father even suspects that there is the love of a man and a woman between us, no matter how much he loves you, he will be honour bound to place your case before the Mullahs to be judged by the Sharia laws. There could be only one verdict for both of us. No, Dowie, there is no escape that way. Our destiny is with God, and he is not always merciful. I will take you away, Dorian declared. We will take one of the Dows and a few of my best men and sail away, find some place where we can live out our love. There is no such place, 
Yasmini told him sadly. We are both of Islam, and there would be no place in Islam for us. We would be outcasts and wanderers forever. Here you are a great man, soon to be greater. You have the love and respect of our father and of all men. I will not let you throw all that away for me. They spent much of their precious time together discussing their terrible predicament. They lay in each other's arms in the moonlight and whispered endlessly. When they saw that there was no escape or release for them, they made love with an almost savage passion, as though to divert the fate that loomed before them. Before dawn each morning, Dorian led her back to the entrance tunnel, where she kissed him as if for the last time and took the angel's road back into the Zenana. During the days, the girl who had once been playful and happy, loved by all the Zenana, was now pale, silent and lethargic. Her friends and all the servants gradually became alarmed. And there was nothing that happened in that little enclosed world that did not come at last to the ears of Cush. Their flawed idyll of love and desperation lasted through the months leading up to the change of the monsoon winds. The expeditionary force to the mainland was almost ready to sail, and the final preparations for Yasmini's wedding were complete. Her dowry had been sent from Muscat to her bridegroom in Abu Dhabi. Her trousseau was packed and ready to go aboard the dhow that would carry her away to her new home thousands of miles to the north, and the confines of another royal zanana in which she would pass the rest of her life. I cannot let this happen, Dorian told her. I will rescue you from that even if I have to forsake everything in this life. No, Dowie, I will not let you do it. You will have many other wives in the years ahead, and you will win glory and happiness without me. No, he said. I do not care about the rest. I care only for you. Then I can never come out to you again along the angel's road, unless you promise me to put this madness out of your mind. This will be the last time we will meet, Dowie. You must swear to me. I cannot do that. Then I will never see you again. He saw that she was determined. Please, Yassi, you cannot be so cruel to both of us. Then make love to me for the last time. Yassi, I cannot go on without you. You are strong. You will go on. Make love to me. Give me something to hold on to, to remember through the years ahead. So they parted at the entrance to the tunnel, and Yasmini ran back through the narrow passage, blinded with her tears. As she clambered out of the opening above the tomb of the saint, a huge hand closed on her arm and lifted her off her feet. As she struggled and kicked, Kush giggled into her face, holding her easily. I have waited many years for this, my little harlot. I knew that one day you would place yourself in my power. You are always too bold and headstrong. Leave me, she screamed. Put me down. No, Kush replied. Now you are mine. Never again will you flout my rules. The other women will listen to your screams and they will quail in their beds and think about the price of sin. My father, she cried, my future husband, they will make you pay dearly if you harm me. Your father barely knows your name. He has many other daughters, and none of them is a whore. Your future husband would never accept rotten, half-chewed fruit into his zanana. No, my little one, from now on you belong to Kush alone. Kush carried her to the little cell beside the cemetery in the rear of the gardens, screened from the rest of the zanana by a hedge of flowering thorns. Two of his assistants were waiting there, eunuchs also, big men, gone to fat, but powerful. They had performed this punishment many times before, and they had made all the preparations. Kush laid Yasmini on the hard wooden frame and carefully took off her clothing. All three were grinning with anticipation, stripped to loincloths, but already sweating in the small hot cell. They touched her body as it was revealed stroking her smooth limbs, sniffing her hair, pinching her small, glossy breasts. Then, when she was naked, they strapped her wrists and ankles with leather thongs until she lay spread-eagled and pinioned. Then Kush stood between her legs and smiled down at her in an almost avuncular fashion. 
You have been taken in harlotry, we know the man, but it spites me that he has grown too powerful to bring to justice. His punishment will be to hear of your fate. The rest of the world beyond these walls will hear that you died of a fever. Many do at this season of the year. However, I will make certain that your lover has the truth whispered in his ear. For the rest of his life he will live with the knowledge that he was responsible for your strange particular death. Still smiling, he leaned forward and placed his fat hand on her private parts, gently stroking the soft nest of fine dark hair between her thighs. I am sure you have heard what happens to all the bad girls who have come to this room. But in case you are uncertain, I will explain it to you as we go along. He nodded to one of the other eunuchs who came to stand beside Cush holding a wooden tray. On it lay two small packets. They were wrapped in fine rice paper, fish-shaped, as long as a finger and tapered at both ends. They gleamed in the lamplight, for they were heavily greased with sheep fat. These each contain five ounces of chilli powder. I grow the pods myself in my little garden. They are the fiercest variety. The juice from my fruit will burn the skin and flesh from the mouth of a mogul, fed all his life on the strongest curries. I have to wear gloves of dog skin to protect my hands when I grind the powder. Suddenly he thrust his fat forefinger deep into her. One for this pretty perfumed little hole in front, he grinned down at her as she screamed with shock, pain and humiliation. Then he pulled out his finger and thrust it in again further back. And the second packet for this other darker cavern at the rear. He withdrew his finger, sniffed it, wrinkled his nose and pulled a face at the other two eunuchs. They tittered with delight. He picked up one of the packets from the tray. Yasmini stared at it in horror and struggled against her bonds. Hold her legs, he grunted at the other two. One of them forced her knees as far apart as they would go. Kush spread the silky fur and the soft lips beyond. Then, with the expertise bred of practice, he slipped the greased packet into her body. See how Al Amhara has opened the way for me and made my task easier, he said, then stood back and wiped his fingers on his loincloth. The front end done. Now for the rear, he said, and picked up the other packet. His assistant reached under Yasmini's body and took one of her small round buttocks in each hand and drew them rudely apart. She was gnawing her lips and her teeth were stained pink with her own blood. She whipped her lithe golden body back and forth as far as her bonds would allow, and tears ran back into her hair. With his free hand, Cush groped between her buttocks. Open it wider, he told the other man. Yes, that's better. So sweet and tight. Yasmini's sobs ended with a sharp, high squeal. Ah, yes, Cush gloated. That's it. All the way. As far as I can reach. He stepped back. Shabash. It is done. Bind her ankles and her knees together so that she cannot expel the sweetmeats. They worked swiftly, then stood back and surveyed their handiwork with satisfaction. Now go out and finish digging the whore's grave. They went out into the cemetery, and soon there came the sound of their spades biting into the sandy earth, their jovial banter as they worked. Kush came to Yasmini's side. Your beer is ready and the sheet to cover you when we lower you into the earth. He pointed them out to her against the far wall. And see, I have even carved your headboard with my own loving hands. He held it up for her to read. It has the date of your death, and tells the world that you died of fever. Yasmini was silent now, her body rigid. Her eyes, wide and glittering with tears, were fastened on his face as he bent over her. You see... The chili powder is so virulent that it will eat its way through the rice paper, while from the outside the juices of your own body will moisten and weaken it further. Soon the packet will dissolve, and the powder will be released into your secret places. 
He stroked her hair back from her forehead, then with his thumb wiped the tears from her eyelids with feminine gentleness. At first you will feel a tiny stinging which will grow into a fire, a raging fire that will make you long for the lesser heat of hell. I have watched many whores die upon this wooden bed, but I do not think there are words to describe their suffering. It will eat out your womb and your bowels like a hundred rats burrowing into your softness, and your screams will carry to every woman in the Zenana. They will remember you when next they are tempted to sin. He was breathing heavily now, and his expression was rapt, deeply aroused by the picture of suffering he was painting. When will it begin? he asked rhetorically. We cannot be sure. In an hour or two, or even longer, there is no way of telling. How long will it last? I cannot tell you. I have seen the weak ones die in a day, and the strong ones last four days screaming to the end. I think you are one of the strong ones. But we will see. He went to the doorway and called to the men who were digging the grave. Are you not finished yet? You cannot come and watch the fun until you are finished. Soon, one paused and leaned on his spade. Only the top of his shaved head was visible above the rim of the excavation. We will be finished before the first packet bursts open. Cush went back into the hut and settled his bulk comfortably on the bench against the far wall. The waiting is the interesting part, he told Yasmini. Some beg for mercy. But I know you are too proud for that. Sometimes the brave ones try to conceal from me the moment when the paper breaks open. They try to deny me my enjoyment, <laughs> but not for long, he giggled. <laughs> not for very long. He folded his arms across his soft, womanly breasts and leaned back against the wall. I will be beside you to the end, Yasmini, to share each exquisite moment with you, and I shall probably shed a tear at your graveside, for I am a man of sentiment and soft-hearted. The word that Kush had taken another girl to the little hut beside the graveyard spread swiftly through the Zanana, and the instant that Tahi heard the rumour, she knew with dreadful certainty who the girl was. She also knew exactly what she must do. She did not hesitate, but threw on a shawl and veil and picked up the basket in which she always brought back her purchases from the town when she was sent on errands by one of the royal wives or concubines. As an ancient free woman, she could pass without check between the Zenana and the open world beyond the walls, and among her duties was the daily trip into the markets. She left her dingy room at the rear of the kitchen block and hurried along the cloisters. She was terrified that one of the eunuchs would stop her before she reached the gates. A deep, unnatural silence hung like a pall over the Zenana, and the gardens and the cloisters were deserted. No child laughed, no woman sang, and the fires in the kitchen were dead and cold. Every inhabitant of the woman's world had locked herself and her offspring in her own quarters. It was so quiet that when Tahi stopped to listen, all she could hear was her own blood pulsing in her ears. Only one of the eunuch guards was on the gate, but he knew her well. He was so distracted by the hushed air of drama that he hardly glanced at her face as she drew back her veil to identify herself. He waved her through with one pudgy, beringed hand. The moment she was out of sight at the gate, she flung away the basket and broke into a heavy run. Within a mile, her heart felt so swollen with fatigue that she could hardly breathe. She fell on the verge of the track and could not force her legs to carry her another step. A slave boy came out of the fields, driving two donkeys ahead of him, laden with bundles of mangrove bark for tanning leather. Tahi staggered to her feet and hunted under her robes for her purse. My daughter is dying, he called to the boy. I must fetch the doctor to her. She held up a silver rupee. Take me to him and there will be another coin for you when we arrive at the fort. The lad ogled the coin, then nodded vigorously. He untied one of the bundles of bark and let it fall on the verge. He boosted Tahi onto the donkey's back, then whipped the little animal into a trot and ran behind it, laughing and calling to Tahi, Hold on tight, old mother. Rabat is as swift as an arrow. We will have you at the port before you have time to blink twice. Dorian sat on the terrace with Ben Abram at his side. 
They were drinking cups of black tarry coffee and were engrossed in compiling a list of the medical supplies that would be needed by the expedition to the mainland. The pair had joyously renewed their friendship at almost the same minute that Dorian had stepped ashore on the beach at Lamu. Every day Ben Abram had come to join him in the morning prayers, and afterwards they sat long together in the pleasant, easy conversation of old friends. I am too old to leave the island, Ben Abraham was protesting at Dorian's insistence that he join the expedition to care for the health of the soldiers. We both know that you are as strong and as spry as the first day we met, Dorian told him. Would you let me die of some horrible disease in the interior? I need you, Ben Abram. Dorian broke off as he heard a commotion at the end of the terrace. He stood up and shouted irritably at the guards. What is this uproar? You have my strict orders that I am not to be disturbed. I am as dust under your feet, great shake, but there is an old crone here who kicks and scratches like a rabid wildcat. Dorian exclaimed with annoyance and was about to order them to send the woman off with a swat across her buttocks when she screeched, al Amhara, It is me, Tahi. In the name of Allah, let me speak to you of someone we both love. Dorian went cold with dread. Tahi would never have been so indiscreet unless some terrible disaster had overtaken Yasmini. Let her pass, he shouted to the guards, and hurried to meet the old woman as she tottered down the terrace, far gone with fatigue and worry. She collapsed at his feet and clung to his knees. Kush knows about you and the girl. He was waiting for Yasmini as she came back to the Zenana, and he has taken her to the little room beside the graveyard she blurted out. From his own sojourn behind the Zenana walls, Dorian knew about the little room. Although it was strictly forbidden, the small boys of the Zenana had dared each other to creep beyond the thorn hedge and go into it to touch the dreadful wooden frame. They terrified each other with horror stories of what Kush did to the women he took there. One of the most chilling memories of all Dorian's days within the Zenana were the shrieks of a girl named Salima, who had been taken there after Kush had discovered her love for a young officer of the governor's guard. Those cries had lasted four days and three nights, growing slowly weaker all that time, and the silence at the end was more harrowing than the shrillest scream had been. For long moments he was unmanned by Tahi's warning. He felt the strength go out of his legs so that he could not move them, and his mind went blank as though trying to hide from the horror of it. Then, with a shudder, he threw off his weakness and turned to Ben Abram. The old doctor came to his feet. His expression was filled with alarm, tempered with compassion. I should not have heard those words, my son. You must have been foolish, mad, beyond any reason. But my heart breaks for you. Help me, old friend, Dorian pleaded. Yes, I have been foolish, and I have committed a terrible sin. But it was the sin of love. You know what Kush will do to her. Ben Abraham nodded. I have seen the fruits of his monstrous cruelty. Ben Abraham, I need your help. By the sheer intensity of his gaze, Dorian tried to will him to it. I cannot enter the Zenana, the old man said. If I bring her out to you, will you help us? Yes, my son. If you can bring her out to me, I will help you, if it is not too late. Ben Abram turned to Tahi. When did he take her to the little room? I know not. Perhaps two hours ago, Tahi sobbed. Well, then we have very little time, said Ben Abram briskly. I have the instruments I need with me. We can go at once. You will never be able to keep pace with me, old father, Dorian strapped on his sword belt. Come after me as fast as you can ride. There is a secret way under the walls on the east side. Swiftly he described how to find the entrance to the tunnel. I have ridden past there and remember the old ruins, Ben Abram murmured. Wait for me there, Dorian said, then raced down the staircase three steps at a time and into the courtyard. As he ran to the stables he saw that one of the grooms was leading out his black stallion to curry it in the yard. The horse had a halter on its lean Arabian head, and was one of the fleetest in Dorian's string of fine animals that the caliph had pressed on him as a parting gift when he left Muscat. He snatched the single rein out of the startled groom's hand and vaulted onto the stallion's bare back. 
As he hammered his heels into the horse's flanks, the stallion jumped away, and before they reached the gates of the fort, he was at full gallop. They raced through the narrow streets, scattering chickens, dogs, and terrified people from their path. As they burst out of the narrow lanes into the open country, Dorian lay flat along the stallion's neck and pushed him to the top of his speed. Go, he whispered in his ear, and the stallion flicked back his ears to listen. Run for the very life of my love. There was a shortcut through the mangroves. Dorian turned the horse off the main road, and they splashed through the mud for a hundred yards until they hit firm ground again, then sped through the palm grove on the far side, saving almost half a mile. The high walls of the Zenano were white through the bowls of the palms, and he sheared off towards the beach to keep out of sight of the gate. Once he was clear, he swung back again and galloped along the base of the wall. He saw the mound of ruins just ahead and leapt down with one arm around the stallion's neck, his feet skimming the earth. He let go before the horse had stopped, and used the momentum to hurl himself up the side of the tumbled ruins and down into the saucer beyond. He dragged aside the trailing branches and ran into the dark opening. The interior was narrower and lower than he remembered it, and it was pitch dark. When the uneven floor started to rise under his feet, he almost fell. At last he saw ahead the dim light from the exit hole and could go on even faster. He jumped up, caught the rim of the opening and with a single movement heaved himself through and out onto the sunlit terrace where long ago Yasmini and her little friends had played with their dolls. It was deserted. He crossed it with long strides and dropped down the staircase on which Zain al-Din had injured his ankle into the garden below. At the bottom, he paused to take his bearings. A pall of silence hung over the Zanana and the gardens. None of the female slaves tended the flower beds and fountains. No person moved, and there was no bird song. In the hush, the very breeze had dropped, as though all nature held its breath. The palm fronds drooped silently, and not a leaf stirred on the high tops of the casuarina trees. He drew his sword knowing that he would kill without hesitation any of the eunuchs who tried to stop him, and went towards the north end of the enclosure, towards the mosque and the cemetery. He ran down the narrow lane between the outer wall and behind the mosque. Ahead was the thorn hedge that surrounded the cemetery. He ducked through the well-remembered gap and looked across the burial ground. Each grave mound had a headboard set above it, and some of the newer graves were still decorated with faded ribbons and flags. The hut was on the far side, and the thorn hedge had almost overgrown and smothered it in the years since he had last seen it. The door was open, and Dorian held his breath as he listened for any sound of suffering coming from the interior. The quiet was suffocating and ominous, seemingly charged with evil. Then he heard voices, the high feminine chatter of a castrated man. He hit the sword under a fold of his robe and slipped forward silently. There was a gust of giggles, and he saw one of the eunuchs sitting on the edge of the newly dug grave, his feet swinging in the hole, the rolls of his belly fat hanging into his lap. Dorian stepped up behind him. He could see the knuckles of his spine through the fat as the man leaned forward to speak to somebody in the pit beneath him. Dorian drove the needle point of the long curved blade of his scimitar through the joint between two vertebrae, separating the spinal cord with a surgeon's stroke. The eunuch died without a murmur, collapsed and slid into the hole, his weight pulling him off the blade. He fell like a sack of lard on the man beneath him. Trapped under his weight, the other man squealed with outrage and struggled to free himself. What are you doing, Sharif? Have you gone mad? Get off me! He pushed off the corpse and rose to his feet. The top of his head was just below ground level, and he was still peering down at the dead man lying at his feet. Get up, Sharif! What game are you playing? The top of his shaven head looked like an ostrich egg. Dorian raised the sword, then slashed down, splitting his skull neatly in half down to the level of his teeth. With a twist of his wrist, he levered the blade from the crisp bone of the skull and turned to the door of the hut. He ran to it, and as he reached it, Kush appeared before him, blocking the door with his huge bulk. They stared at each other for only a fleeting moment, but Kush recognised him. 
He had been among the crowd on the beach when Dorian had stepped ashore on his arrival with the flotilla from Muscat. With astonishing speed and agility for such a gross creature, he leapt back into the room and snatched up a spade that stood against the wall. With another leap he put the heavy wooden frame on which Yasmini was stretched out between him and Dorian and raised the spade high over the girl. Stay back, he screamed. With a single blow I can burst the bags inside her and release the poison. Yasmini lay naked under his threat. Her long, slim legs trussed tightly together at ankle and knee, and her arms stretched out over her head, pulling her tender golden breasts out of shape. She looked up at Dorian, but even her huge eyes were not large or deep enough to contain all her terror. Dorian launched himself across the room just as Cush started to bring down the blade with all his strength behind it. Dorian came in under the blow before it struck Yasmini in her tender midriff, spreading his body over hers, shielding her. The spade struck his back, and he felt his ribs crack. Pain flared through his chest. He rolled over the frame, forcing himself to ignore the pain, careful not to place his weight on her body and break the fragile sacks. Cush lifted the spade again, and this time aimed at Dorian's head. His fat face was a mask of fury, and his great belly bulged forward over his loincloth. Dorian's whole left side was numb from the blow, and he was down on one knee, unable to rise in time to meet the next. He still had the sword in his right hand. He reached out with the blade, and drew the edge across Kush's belly from side to side at the level of his navel, opening him up the way a fishwife splits the stomach of a grouper. Kush dropped the spade which clattered onto the stone floor. He reeled back against the far wall, and with both hands tried to hold the lips of the long wound closed. He stared down at it with an air of astonishment, and watched his own entrails bulge out between his fingers in slippery ropes. The hot, fetid stink of his ruptured gut filled the little room. Dorian dragged himself to his feet. His left arm dangled at his side, numb and useless, and he leaned over Yasmini. I prayed that you would come, she whispered. I did not think it was possible, and now it is too late. Kush has put terrible things inside me. I know what he has done, Dorian told her. Don't talk. Lie still. Kush gave a high, keening cry, but Dorian barely glanced at him as he slumped forward on his face, then kicked and struggled weakly in the mess of his own guts. Dorian slipped the blade of his scimitar between Yasmini's ankles and cut the leather thongs. Then he did the same for those at her knees. Don't try to sit up. Any contraction might burst the bags. With a touch of the razor edge, he cut the bonds that held her wrists, then dropped the sword and massaged his paralysed left arm. With a surge of relief, he felt it begin to tingle, and the strength flowing down it to his fingertips. He slipped his arm under Yasmini's shoulders, lifted her carefully off the wooden frame and set her on her feet. Squat, he ordered. Slowly. Make no sudden movement. He held her down. Now spread your knees apart and push gently, as though you were at stool. He knelt down beside her and placed his arm around her shoulders. Gently to begin with, then harder. She took a deep breath and bore down, her face contorted and darkened with blood. There was a sudden spluttering sound, and one of the packets was driven out of her body with such force that it hit the floor between her feet and burst open, spilling the red powder across the flagstones. The acrid chemical smell of chilli mingled with the stink of Cush's faeces and stung their nostrils. Good. Well done, Yassi. He held her tighter. Can you do the same with the other sack? I will try. She took another breath and strained again. But after a minute she gave a sharp sigh and shook her head. No, it will not move. I can't do it. Then Abram is waiting at the end of the Angel's Road, he said. I am taking you to him. He will know what to do. Gently he lifted her to her feet. You must not try to walk. The least movement might burst the bag. Slowly now, put one arm around my neck. Hold on. 
He slipped his good arm under her knees and lifted her easily. As he strode to the door, Cush was moaning and blubbering. Help me! Don't leave me! I am dying! Dorian did not look back. He skirted the open grave in the bottom of which lay the two dead eunuchs. He went quickly, dreading meeting another, for he had left his scimitar on the floor of the hut, and he did not yet have full use of his injured arm. Much more he dreaded jolting or squeezing Yasmini. He had to try to balance speed against caution, and he whispered soft reassurance to her as he went, trying to calm and comfort her. It'll be all right, my little one. Ben Abram will be able to rid you of it. It will soon be over. He crossed the lawns with a smooth stride that cushioned his precious burden, and he climbed the staircase to the terrace of the saint's tomb one step at a time, treading lightly. He lowered her through the opening into the tunnel, and when he scrambled down beside her, he peered anxiously into her face for any sign that the movement had triggered something unspeakable within her tender womanhood. Are you all right? he asked. She nodded and tried to smile. We are nearly there now. Ben Abram is waiting. He lifted her again and had to bend almost double to clear the low roof as he started down the tunnel. He saw the light ahead and almost involuntarily took a longer step. A fragment of loose coral rolled under his foot and he stumbled and almost fell, bumping her into the wall. Ah! Yasmini gasped as she was jolted and Dorian felt his heart constrict. What is it, my darling? It stings inside me, she whispered. Oh, Allah, it burns! He ran the last few paces and carried her out into the sunlit saucer among the ruins. Ben Abram, Dorian shouted. In God's name, where are you? Here, my son. Ben Abram stood up from where he had been waiting in the shade and hurried to them, lugging his bag. It has begun, old father. Make haste. They laid her on the ground, and Dorian gasped out an almost incoherent explanation of how Yasmini had rid herself of one packet. But the other is still inside her, and it has begun to leak. Hold her knees up like this, Ben Abram said, and then to Yasmini, I am going to hurt you. These are the instruments I use in childbirth. They glittered in his hands. She closed her eyes. I submit myself to the will of God, she murmured, and dug her fingernails into Dorian's forearm as Ben Abram went to work. The evidence of her pain rippled across her lovely face and tightened and twisted her lips. Once she made a small mewing sound and Dorian whispered helplessly, I love you, flower of my heart. I love you, Dowie, she gasped, but there is a burning fire inside me. I am going to cut you now, Ben Abram said. A moment later, Yasmini cried out and her whole body stiffened. Dorian looked down and saw blood on Ben Abram's hands as he took up a silver instrument shaped like a double spoon. A minute later, he sat back on his heels with the blood-smeared, sodden, half-disintegrated packet captured between the spoons. I have it, he said, but it has leaked the spice into her. We must get her down to the water quickly. Dorian snatched her up, his injured arm and the pain of his cracked ribs forgotten. He ran with Yasmini's naked body clutched to his chest. Ben Abram hobbled along behind them, losing distance as Dorian tore away between the palm trees. He ran down the beach and into the ocean, plunging Yasmini into the cool green water. Ben Abram came in after them with a brass enema syringe in his hand. Dorian held Yasmini's lower body beneath the surface while Ben Abram repeatedly filled the tube of the syringe with seawater and forced it into her. It was almost half an hour before he was satisfied and allowed Dorian to carry her out of the water and up the beach. She was trembling with shock and pain. Dorian wrapped her in his wooden shawl, and they laid her in a shaded place under the trees. Ben Abram took a large bottle of salve from his bag and anointed her injuries. After a while her shivering abated, and she told them, The pain is passing now. It still burns but not as badly. I was able to remove most of the poison in the spoons. I think I managed to flush out the rest before it did much damage. I had to cut you to reach the sack, but it is a clean cut, and I will stitch it up now. The salve will heal the wound swiftly. 
He smiled at her encouragingly as he prepared a needle and catgut. You have been lucky, and you have Tahi and Al Salil to thank for that. What will we do now, Dowie? She held out one hand to Dorian. He took it and squeezed it. I can never go back into the Zenana. She looked like the little monkey-faced girl again, pale and huddled in the shawl, bedraggled wet hair hanging limply over her shoulders, eyes underlined with purple shadows of pain. You are never going back into the Zenana again. I give you my oath on it. Dorian leaned across and kissed her bruised, swollen lips. Then he stood up and his expression turned grim. I must leave you here with Ben Abram while he finishes his work, he said. I also have work to do, but I will return very soon before Ben Abram is done. Be brave, my love. He strode back through the trees, jumped down into the saucer and went along the tunnel under the walls of the Zenana. He climbed out cautiously onto the terrace of the saint's tomb and took a minute to listen and watch. All was deathly quiet, so he dropped down the stairs and crossed the lawns. He paused behind the thorn hedge of the graveyard and satisfied himself that the corpses of the eunuchs had not been discovered or the alarm raised. Then he went forward cautiously. At the door of the hut he paused to allow his eyes to adjust to the gloom after the strong sunlight. Cush was curled up on the floor in the position of an unborn child in the womb. His bloody hands were still clutching his open stomach and his eyes were closed. Dorian thought he was dead. But as he stepped up to the eunuch, he opened his eyes. His expression changed. Please, help old Kush, he muttered. You were always a good boy, Al-Amkhara. You would not let me die. Dorian stooped and picked up his sword from the floor. Kush became more animated. No, don't kill me. In the name of Allah, I beg you for mercy. Dorian slid the blade into the scabbard on his belt, and Cush whimpered with relief. I said you were a good boy. Help me onto the litter. He tried to crawl towards the beer that he would have used to take Yasmini to her grave, but the movement opened the great wound in his belly. Fresh blood trickled out, and he subsided again, clutching himself. Help me, Al Amkhara. Call others to help carry me to a surgeon. Dorian's expression was merciless as he stooped and seized Kush's ankles, then leaned back and dragged him across the floor towards the door. No, don't do that. You will open the wound further, Kush squealed, but Dorian ignored his protests. There was a long, slippery mark of blood and gastric juices on the flags behind Kush. Dorian hauled him feet first through the doorway into the sunlight. Cush moaned and grabbed the jam of the door, hanging onto it with the strength of a drowning man. Dorian dropped his legs, and in one movement almost too swift for the eye to follow, he drew and swung his scimitar, lopping off the three fingers of Cush's right hand that were clawed around the doorpost. Cush howled and held his mutilated hand to his chest. He stared down at it in horrified astonishment. You, you have maimed me, he stuttered. Dorian sheathed the sword, seized the eunuch's ankles again, and dragged him through the dirt of the cemetery towards the open grave. They had covered half the short distance before Cush realised what he intended. Now his screams were high and girlish, and he rolled and struggled so that his dangling entrails flapped and twisted in the sand. The woman listening to your caterwauling will think your foul packets have burst inside Yasmini's belly, Dorian grunted. Sing on, you great bag of pig fat. There is no one to help you now, this side of the devil in hell. With one last heave, he tipped Kush into the grave on top of the other two bodies and looked down at him, standing with both hands on his hips while he recovered his breath and waited for the pain in his broken ribs to subside a little. Cush read his own death in those green eyes. Mercy, he tried to rise, but the agony in his guts was too great, and he drew up his knees to his chest and huddled against the side wall of the new-cut earth. Dorian went back and fetched the spade. When he returned and took up the first spadeful of earth, Cush screamed, No! 
No, how can you do this thing to me? As easily as you performed your unspeakable cruelties upon the defenceless women in your charge, Dorian replied. Cush screamed and pleaded until the earth smothered his cries. Dorian worked on doggedly until the grave was filled in over the three bodies. Then he stamped it down and shaped the mound neatly. From the hut he fetched the headboard with Yasmini's name carved on it and planted it on the mound. He tied a burial ribbon around it with the prayer for the dead embroidered on it. Then he replaced the spade in the hut gathered up the pieces of severed leather thongs and took down Cush's robes from where the eunuch had hung them on a peg in the wall. He rolled them into a bundle and tied it with a length of leather thong. Before he left the room, he glanced around to make certain that all was in order and smiled grimly. For the next hundred years, the poets will sing of the disappearance of the three eunuchs after they had murdered and buried the lovely Princess Yasmini. Perhaps the devil himself came to escort them down to hell. Nobody will ever know. But what a fine legend it will make for posterity. Then he left the Zenana for the last time along the Angel's Road. When Dorian returned to where he had left them, Ben Abraham had finished stitching Yasmini's injuries and was binding them up with a wad of cotton. It is well done, Al-Salil he assured Dorian. Seven days from now I will remove the stitches and within a month she will be completely healed as though it never happened. Dorian wrapped Yasmini in Cush's soft robes of finest wool, then helped her gently onto the stallion's back, holding her across his lap so there was no pressure on her wounds. They started back at a sedate pace towards the fort. She was so completely swathed in the voluminous robes that no inquisitive person they passed on the road would be able to tell if she were man or woman. No one outside the Zenana has ever seen your face before. They will never recognize you as the Princess Yasmini, for she lies under her headboard in the graveyard of the Zenana. Am I really free, Dowie? she whispered with difficulty, for despite his care the stitches were pulling painfully. No, you silly little baggage. You are now the slave boy who belongs to the great Sheikh al-Salil. You will never be free. Never, she asked. Promise me that I will be your slave forever, that you will never let me go. I swear it to you. Then I am well content. She laid her head on his shoulder. For many weeks thereafter, strange rumours were whispered in the souks of Lamu about the disappearance of Kush the eunuch. He had been well known in the islands, feared and hated even outside the walls of the Zenana. Some said that while walking on the road by night, he had been taken by the forest jinns. In another version of the same story, the abductor was Shaitan himself. The more pragmatic believed he had stolen from his master, Caliph al-Malik, and that, fearful of discovery and retribution, the eunuch had hired a dhow to take him across the channel and had fled into the interior of Africa. To give substance to this story, the Sheikh al-Salil issued a warrant for the arrest of Kush and offered a reward of 10,000 rupees for his capture. After a month or so, when nothing further was heard of the eunuch, the idlers in the souks lost interest in the case. The new topic of discussion on the island became the cessation of the Kaskazi winds, the beginning of the Kuzi, and the opening of a new trading season. Also, the imminent departure of the expeditionary army of Sheikh al-Salil for the mainland diverted interest from three missing eunuchs. Among the Sheikh's large retinue, few took much notice of the new slave boy Yassi. Though the lad was remarkably pretty and graceful of body, even in his ankle-length robes, at first he seemed in ill health, shy and uncertain of himself. However, the servant woman Tahi, the childhood nurse of the sheikh and herself a newcomer to the household, took the boy under her protection. Yassi shared her quarters, and soon his beauty and pleasant ways won over all the other servants and slaves. Yassi had a trilling, unbroken voice and played the sistrum with rare skill. When Sheikh al-Salil sent for him every evening to sing to him in his private chambers, soothing away the worries and cares of the day, none of the household thought it strange. 
Within weeks, Yassi had obviously found special favour with his master and was made one of the sheikh's body servants. Then the sheikh ordered Yassi to spread his sleeping mat in the tiny curtained alcove of his sleeping chamber, within easy call of Al-Salil's own bed, so that he could minister to his needs during the night. On the first night of this new arrangement, Al-Salil returned late from the war council with his Dao captains on the terrace. Yassi had been dozing while he waited for him and sprang to his feet as Al-Salil entered the chamber, attended by Batula. Yassi had pitchers of hot water ready on the brazier, and after Batula helped the sheikh strip down to his loincloth, Yassi poured the water over Al-Salil's head and body so that he could bathe. In the meantime, Batula hung his master's weapons on the pegs beside his bed, sword and dagger honed, shield burnished, then came to kneel for his master's pleasure. You may leave me now, Batula, but wake me in the hour before dawn, for there remains much still to be done before we sail. As he spoke, Al-Salil dried himself on the cloth Yassi handed him. Sleep well, Batula, and may the eyes of God watch over your slumbers. The moment the curtains fell over the doorway behind Batula, Dorian and Yasmini grinned at each other, and he reached out for her. I have waited too long, he said, but she danced back out of reach. I have my duties to complete, noble master. I must dress your hair and oil your body. She knelt behind him while he sat on a silk rug, and with a cloth she rubbed his hair until it was almost dry, then combed it out and plaited it into a single thick braid down his naked back. While she worked, she gave small murmurs of admiration and awe, so thick and beautiful, the colour of gold and saffron. Then she massaged his shoulders with perfume coconut oil and touched the scars on his body. Where did this happen? At a place called the Pass of the Bright Gazelle. His eyes were closed, and he submitted to the skilful touch of her fingers, for in the Zanana she had been taught the arts of pleasing a future husband. When he was lulled and almost asleep, she leaned forward. Are you still so ticklish here, Dowie? And she thrust her tongue deep into his ear. It galvanised him, and he gasped in protest. Goose pimples rose on his muscled forearms, and he reached back and grabbed her around the waist. You must be taught more respect, slave. He carried her to the bed, dropped her on it, and knelt astride her, pinning her arms above her head. For a while they laughed into each other's face, and then the laughter stopped. He bent his head and laid his mouth on hers. Her lips opened warm and wet to receive him, and she whispered into his mouth, I did not know that my heart could hold so much love. Thou hast too many clothes, he murmured. And swiftly she wriggled out of them, arching her back to let him draw them out from under her and throw them onto the floor. Thou art beautiful beyond the telling of it, he said, considering the silky golden length of her. But is thy body healed? It is, completely. But do not take my word for it, master. Prove it to thine own satisfaction, and to mine. When the koozie wind blew steady and strong down the channel, and the skies were burning blue, devoid of thunderheads, the flotilla of Sheikh al-Salil sailed from Lamu, and three days later made its landfall on the African mainland. Under the waving silk of the blue banner they disembarked, and the long lines of armed men and draft animals wound away from the fever coast, marching inland along the slave road into the interior. The sheikh rode in the van, and close behind him followed the slave boy Yassi. Some of the men remarked on the adoration and hero worship with which the lad looked at his master and smiled indulgently. For the long months after their escape from Zanzibar, Tom Courtney explored the coast of the mainland. He kept well south of the Arab trade routes, avoiding any encounter with the Omani, either on land or sea. They were looking for the river mouth that Fundi, the elephant hunter, called the Lunga. Without the little man's help, they might never have found the entrance, for the channel doubled back upon itself, 
forming an optical illusion, so that from the sea the land seemed unbroken, and a ship might sail past without suspecting the existence of the river mouth. Once the little vessel was safely into the channel, Tom launched the two longboats. In them he sent Luke Jarvis and Alf Wilson to follow the main channel and guide the swallow through. There were many false channels and dead ends among the papyrus beds, but they threaded their way along them. Many a time they were forced to turn back when the channel they were following pinched out. It took them days of searching and gruelling labour to warp the swallow through, and Tom gave thanks for her shallow draught. Without it they would never have been able to cross the numerous sandbars and shallows. Eventually they came out into the main flow of the river. The papyrus beds were infested by villainous-looking crocodiles and grunting, bellowing river horses. Over them hung a canopy of swarming insects. Vast flocks of shrieking, bleating wildfowl rose from the reeds as they passed. Abruptly the reed beds fell away, and they sailed through stretches of meadow-like floodplains and stands of open forest on either bank. Here... Herds of strange animals lifted their heads from grazing and watched the little vessels pass, then snorted with alarm and stampeded away into the forest. Their numbers and variety were bewildering, and the sailors crowded the ship's rail to stare and marvel at them. There were graceful antelope, some the size of English red deer, others much larger, with strange, fantastic horns, scimitar-shaped, or lunate, or corkscrewed, not antlered like the deer they knew from home. Each day they went ashore to hunt these animals. The game was confiding, obviously never having seen white men with firearms, so that the hunters were able to approach within easy musket shot and bring them down with a well-placed lead ball. They never lacked for meat, and they pickled and dried what they could not eat immediately. Once they had butchered the kill, gutting and quartering the carcasses, even stranger creatures came to scavenge the bones and offal they left on the river bank. The first to arrive were carrion birds, undertaker storks and vultures of half a dozen species, which filled the sky above with a dark revolving cloud, then swooped in to settle. Graceful and majestic in flight, they were grotesque and gruesome in repose. After the birds came spotted dog-like creatures that whooped and wailed like banshees, and little red foxes with black backs and silver flanks. Then they saw the first lions. Tom did not need Aberley to tell him what these great main cats were. He recognised them from the coats of arms of kings and noblemen in England and from the illustrations in a hundred books in the library at High Weald. The roaring and monstrous grunting of these beasts in the night thrilled the men as they swung in their hammocks, and Sarah crept closer into Tom's arms in the narrow bunk in their little cabin. In the forests and glades they searched for sign of elephant, their intended quarry, whose tusks would repay them for all this effort and endeavour. Fundi and Aberley pointed out great pad marks, moulded rock hard in the sun-baked clay. These were made last season in the big wet, they told Tom. Then they came across trees in the forest that had been cast down as though by a mighty wind, stripped of their topmost branches and bark. But the trees were dried out and their injuries long ago withered. A year ago, said Fundi, their heads have gone on and might not return for many seasons. The land became hilly, and the Lunga River twisted through the valleys, becoming swifter, flawed with rapids. Soon they could force their way through only with difficulty, for boulders and sharp black rocks guarded the channel, and each mile they went put the little swallow in deeper peril. In the end, there was a place where the river formed an oxbow around a low, forested hill. Tom and Sarah went ashore and climbed to the top. They sat together on the brow, and Tom surveyed the land below them through his telescope. It's a natural fortress, he said at last. We are surrounded on three sides by the river. We need only build a palisade across the narrow neck, and we will be secure from man and animal. Then he turned and pointed out a small bay with smooth rock sides. There is a perfect mooring for the swallow. What will we do here? Sarah asked, for there are still no elephants. Well, this will be our base camp, he explained. From here we can press on into the interior by longboat or on foot until we find the herds that Fundi has promised us. 
They built a palisade of heavy logs across the neck of the oxbow. They took ashore the cannon from the swallow and mounted them in earthen emplacements to cover the glasses in front of the palisade. Then they constructed wooden huts and plastered the walls with mud and thatched them with reeds from the riverbank. Dr Reynolds set up his clinic in one of the huts and laid out his surgical instruments and medicines. Each day he forced every member of the party to swallow a spoonful of the bitter grey quinine powder he had purchased in the markets of Zanzibar, and though the drug made their ears sing and they protested and cursed him for it, there was no fever in the camp. Sarah became his willing apprentice, and soon she could stitch up the gash in a foot caused by a carelessly swung axe or administer a purge or bleed a sick man with as much aplomb as her teacher. Sarah chose the site for their living hut at a discreet distance from the others. It had a fine view over the river valley to blue mountains in the distance. She used cotton cloth from the bolts of trade goods to sew curtains and bedclothes. Then she designed the furniture and had the ship's carpenters build it for her. Ned Tyler had a farmer's instincts, and to augment the diet of venison and biscuit, he started a vegetable garden with seeds he had brought from England. He watered them through irrigation ditches he had dug on the river bank. Then he fought a never-ending war with the monkeys and apes that came to raid the green sprouts as they pushed out through the soil. Within a few months the camp was complete, and Sarah named it Fort Providence. A week later Tom loaded the longboats with trade goods, powder, muskets and shot. With Fundy to guide them, he set out on a hunting and exploring expedition further upstream in search of the elusive elephant herds and of the native tribes with whom they could open trade. Ned Tyler was left with five men in charge of Fort Providence. Sarah remained with Ned also, for Tom would not allow her to make the journey upstream until he knew what dangers lay ahead. She would take over Dr Reynolds's duties from him in his absence, and she had plans to continue her home-building work. She stood on the landing and waved to Tom until the longboats disappeared around the next bend in the river. Three days' travel beyond the fort, the longboats moored for the night at a confluence with a smaller stream, while they gathered firewood and built shelters of thorn branches to keep out nocturnal predators, Fundi and Abuli scouted the banks of the stream. They'd been gone only for a short time, before Fundy came scurrying back through the trees. His eyes were dancing with excitement as he poured out a flood of gabbled explanation. When he came to the end, Tom had understood only a few words. He had to wait for Abberley to come into the camp to hear the full report. Fresh sign, Abberley told him. A day old, a big head, maybe a hundred, and a few big bulls with them. We must follow them at once. Tom was more excited than the little hunter, but Abberley pointed to the sun, which stood only a finger's width above the treetops. It will be dark before we have gone a mile. We will start at first light in the morning. Such a head will be easy to follow. They are moving slowly, feeding as they go, and they will leave a road through the forest. Before darkness fell, Tom had planned the expedition. There would be four musketeers to attack the great beasts, himself and Abberley, Alf Wilson and Luke Jarvis. Each hunter would have two men to carry the spare guns to reload and to hand him a freshly charged musket after each discharge. Tom checked the weapons himself. They were the rifled muskets that he had purchased in London. He made certain there were spare flints for the locks, that the powder flasks were filled and the bullet bags bulged with antimony-hardened lead balls for the ten-bore firearms. Ten bore signified that ten of the lead balls it threw weighed one pound. While he worked on the weapons, Abberley filled the water skins and made certain they had biscuit and dried meat for a three-day journey. Even after the long day of rowing and dragging the boats through the shallows, everyone in the party was too excited to sleep. They sat late around the fires, listening to the strange sounds of the African night, the whistle and hoot of the night birds, the idiotic giggling of the hyena and the rumbling roars of a pride of lions hunting the far hills. Often, in the short time he had been with them, Tom had listened to the stories of Fundy, 
as he told of the hunt for the mighty grey beasts. But he asked the little man to repeat them now. Aberley translated when Tom could not follow, but his own knowledge of the Lotzi language was burgeoning, and he could understand much of what Fundy said. Fundy explained again how the elephant had very poor eyesight, but possessed a sense of smell that could warn him of a hunter a mile or more upwind. He can suck up your scent out of the air and hold it in the bone cavities of his head, run with it for a great distance and blow it through his trunk into the mouths of his companions. Into the mouths? Tom questioned him avidly. Not the nostrils? The smell of the inzu is in the top lip, Fundy explained. His name for the elephant denoted a wise old man, not an animal, and he used it with respect and affection, expressing the feeling of the true hunter for his quarry. There are pink buds in his mouth, like the flowers of the kigilia tree. With these he tastes the air. With a stick, Fundy drew the outline of the beast in the dust, and they craned forward in the firelight to watch as he explained where a man must place his arrow to bring down one of the giants. Here! He touched a spot behind the shoulder of his drawing. With great care not to strike the bones of the leg, which are like tree trunks. Deep! Drive the iron in deep, for the heart and the lungs are hidden behind skin this thick. He showed the span of his thumb. And muscle and ribs, he held out his arms. You must go in this deep to kill the Inzu, the wise old grey man of the forest. When Fundy stopped talking at last, Tom implored him to continue. But he stood up with dignity. It will be a long, weary way tomorrow, and it is time to rest now. I will teach you more when we are on the spoor. Tom lay awake until the moon had almost completed its circuit of the heavens, excitement boiling in his blood. When he closed his eyes, the image of the quarry appeared in his imagination. He had never laid eyes on the living beast, but he had seen hundreds of their tusks piled in the markets of the Spice Islands, and he remembered again the mighty pair that his father had bought from Consul Grey in Zanzibar, which now stood in the library at High Weald. I'll kill another beast like that one, he promised himself. And in the hour before dawn he fell into a sleep so deep and dark that Aberley had to shake him awake. Tom left two men to guard the longboats, and in the first chilly glimmer of dawn they struck out along the trail that the elephant herd had left down the river bank. As Aberley had told him, the sign was clear to read, and they moved forward steadily. As the light strengthened, they went faster, and the trees they passed were smashed and stripped of bark and branches. Huge piles of yellow dung littered the forest floor, and troops of monkeys and flocks of brown partridge-like wild birds were scratching in it for undigested seeds and fruits. Here, Aberley pointed to one of these piles, this is the dropping of a very old bull, one that might carry heavy tusks. The ivory never stops growing until the beast dies. How do you tell his dung from that of a young animal? Tom wanted to know. The old man cannot digest his food properly. Aberley dug his toe into the pile. See, the twigs are still whole, and the leaves entire. Here are the nuts of the ivory palm, with half the flesh still on the pip. Tom considered the first scrap he had been thrown of the law of the hunt. In the late morning they reached the point where the herd had left the stream and turned west towards the hills. Here they crossed an area where the surface was of fine talc dust. In this medium the imprint of the elephant pads was so detailed that each crack and wrinkle was faithfully preserved. Here, Aberley pointed out a string of pad marks, this is the spore of the great bull. See the size of each footprint, the front foot round and the back foot more oval in shape. Aberley placed his own arm beside one of the tracks, using its length from the tip of his finger to the elbow as a yardstick. So long means that he is a mighty bull, and see how his pads are worn smooth. He is of great age. Unless his tusks are worn or broken, this will truly be an animal worthy of the chase. They crossed the first line of hills, 
and in the lush valley beyond, Fundi and Aberley divined from the sign that the herd had fed and rested the previous night. We have gained many hours on them, Fundi exulted. They are not far ahead. But Tom was to learn that day that Fundi's idea of distance did not coincide with his own. By nightfall they were still on the herd's tracks, and Fundi was still assuring them that they were not far ahead. All the white men in the party were nearing exhaustion, for sailors are not accustomed to covering such distances on foot. They had hardly the will left to eat a biscuit and a stick of dried meat to swallow a few mouthfuls of water from the skins before they fell asleep on the hard earth. The next morning, while it was still dark, they were away again after the herd. Before long it was clear from the sign that they had lost much of their gain of the previous day, for the herd had kept moving westward in the moonlight while they had slept. For most of the white men the march became an endless torment of thirst, aching muscles and blistered feet. Tom was still young and tough and eager enough to make light of the hardship, forging along behind the trackers with the heavy musket over his shoulders. Close! We are very close now! Fundy grinned with malicious glee, and the grueling miles dropped behind them. By now the water skins were almost empty, and Tom had to warn the men with dire threats not to drink without permission. Tiny black flies swarmed around their heads and crawled into their ears, eyes and nostrils. The sun beat down like a hammer on an anvil and reflected up from the stony ground. The hooked thorns clawed at their legs as they passed, ripping their clothing and leaving bloody lines on their skin. At last they found where the herd had stopped in a patch of dense forest, had spent many hours resting, dusting themselves and breaking down branches before it drifted on again, and the hunters finally made a real gain upon it. Abelie pointed out to Tom how the dung that the herd was now dropping had not had time to dry, and when he thrust his finger into one pile, he could feel the residual body heat. Clouds of brightly coloured butterflies hovered over the warm turds to drink up the moisture. With renewed strength in their legs, they increased the pace and climbed another line of hills. On the rocky slopes grew strange trees with swollen trunks and crowns of leafless branches on their tops, fifty feet above the ground. At the base of one tree, huge furry seed pods were heaped. Abelie cracked one open. The black seeds inside were coated with a yellow pithy layer. Suck the seeds, he said. The pleasant sour taste made their saliva flow again and relieved the burning thirst of the march. The line of hunters, burdened by their weapons and water skins, toiled on up the hill. Just below the crest, their heads went up. An awful sound came to them on the heated air, distant but stirring as the blast on a war trumpet. Though Tom had never heard the like before, he knew instinctively what it was. Quickly he ordered the column to halt below the crest of the hill. Most of the men collapsed thankfully in the shade. He, Aberly and Fundy crept up to the skyline. They used a tree trunk to break their silhouette as they peered over into the valley beyond, and Tom's heart leapt against his ribs like a caged beast. Down the length of the valley below them was strung out a line of sparkling green pools, each surrounded by lush reed beds and spreading shade trees. The elephant herd was gathered around the pools, some of the huge animals standing in the shade, fanning themselves with their ears, which seemed to Tom as wide as the mainsail of the swallow. Others were standing on the yellow sandbanks that surrounded the pools, dipping their trunks into the green water and sucking up gargantuan draughts, then curling their trunks into their mouths and sending it hissing down their throats with the force of a ship's bilge pump. Younger animals crowded into the pools. Like rowdy children, they frolicked and splashed, beating the water white with their trunks, shaking their huge heads and flapping their ears. Their wet bodies were black and shining. Some lay flat, then rolled onto their sides, disappearing entirely below the surface, leaving only their trunks writhing above the surface like a sea serpent. Tom went down on one knee and raised his telescope to his eye. This first sighting of the legendary beasts was so far beyond anything he had imagined that he was lost in wonder. He delighted in every detail. One of the youngest calves, not much bigger than a large pig, but mischievous and bumptious, charged out of the water 
and with swinging trunk and murderous trumpeting chased the white egrets that were perched on the edge of the pool. The birds rose in a gratifying white cloud, and the small elephant swaggered back into the water, slipped almost immediately in the mud, and trapped itself under a submerged log. Its now terrified squeals brought every protective female within earshot, rushing to the rescue, convinced that the calf had been taken by a crocodile. It was dragged out of the water, its dignity destroyed, and it fled, chastened, to hide between the legs of its mother and suckle for comfort at the milk-swollen udders between her front legs. Tom laughed aloud. Then Abelie touched his shoulder and pointed out a group of three huge animals that stood aloof from the raucous behaviour of the cows and calves. They were in a patch of dense bush on the far side of the water, standing shoulder to shoulder, ears flapping lazily. Occasionally, one picked up a load of dust in his trunk and dashed it over his head and back. Apart from that, they seemed to be sleeping on their feet. Through the lens, Tom studied this towering trio, which dwarfed every other animal in the herd. He examined the long ivory shafts they carried and saw at once that though they were all massive, the bull in the centre carried tusks that protruded beyond his lip almost the length of a boat saw and with a girth of Sarah's slim waist. He felt the pulse of his hunter's blood pound in his ears at each pump of his heart. This was the bull he had dreamed of, and his instinct was to seize the musket he had propped against the tree beside him and rush down to do battle with the giant. But Abberley sensed his mood and laid a restraining hand on his shoulder. These are sage and wary creatures, he warned Tom. It will not be easy to come up to that bull down there. His females will guard and protect him. It will call for all our cunning and caution to outwit them. Explain to me what we must do, said Tom. And Abeli and Fundi lay on each side of him and planned the hunt. The wind is the key, Abeli told him. We must always keep below the wind. There is no wind, Tom said and pointed to the leaves that hung lifelessly from the top branches of the trees in the heated noonday. There is always wind, Abberley contradicted him, and let a handful of dust trickle through his fingers. The fine golden motes floated in the sunlight, then drifted slowly away. Abberley made a delicate gesture, describing the movement down the valley. When they are alarmed, they will always run with the wind in their faces, then they will circle to come above the wind and take the scent. He made another gesture to illustrate this manoeuvre. We will place Alf and Luke there and there, he pointed out the positions. When they are in place, you and I will come down here, he pointed out the path of their stalk. We will creep in close. When we fire, the bulls will be driven on to the others. Tom gestured for Alf and Luke to come up beside him on the ridge. Once they had recovered from their initial amazement at the first sight of the quarry, he gave them their orders, sending them to circle out behind the ridge and cross it a mile further down the valley where they would be out of sight and below the wind of the herd. It was almost an hour later that through the telescope he made out the two parties of hunters moving up the valley into the positions he had assigned them. It was good to have men under him who knew his mind and could carry out his orders so faithfully. Arbally leading, they slipped quietly over the skyline, using the trees and scrub to screen their crossing. The great beasts were not so dim-sighted that they could not pick up alien movement. They crept down towards the pools with painstaking stealth, taking care not to run into one of the females scattered among the trees. Tom could barely credit how such a huge animal could become virtually invisible when it stood still among the thick bush, grey on grey, even its legs resembling the tree trunks. Slowly they closed in on the trio of bulls. Although they were still invisible, the hunters were guided by their deep rumblings. Tom whispered to Abelie, Is that the sound of their bellies? Abelie shook his head. The old men are speaking to each other. Occasionally they saw a cloud of dust rise above the tops of the bush as one of the bulls dusted himself. It guided them through the thick undergrowth. Step by cautious step they went forward, 
once having to pull back and circle around a young cow and her nursing calf in the scrub between them and their quarry. At last, Fundy stopped them with a gesture of his pink palm, then pointed ahead. Tom went down on one knee and, looking below the hanging vines and branches, made out the massive grey forelegs of the nearest bull. The sweat of excitement was trickling into his eyes and stinging like seawater. He wiped it away with the bandana knotted around his throat and checked the lock and flint of his musket. Abelie nodded at him, and he drew back the hammer to half-cock. They began to crawl forward. Slowly, more of the nearest beast came into view. The droop of his belly, the baggy grey skin hanging in folds around his knees. Then the lower curve of one thick yellow tusk. They crawled in closer still, and Tom saw that the tusk was stained with the juices of bark that the bull had stripped from the forest trees. Closer still, and he could see every crease and wrinkle in the skin, each wiry hair in the stubby tail. Tom looked at Abelie and made the gesture of firing, but Abelie shook his head vehemently and signed to him to move in closer still. The bull was rocking gently on his feet. And then, to Tom's amazement, something extraordinary began to issue from between its back legs. It was thicker than a man's thigh and seemed to extend endlessly until it was dangling almost to the ground. Tom had to make an effort to prevent himself laughing. Drowsy and contented, the old man was letting his member dangle out and engorge. Again, Tom glanced at Abelie for instruction, and again Abelie scowled and urged him forward. But at that moment the bull stepped back and reached up with his trunk to pluck a bunch of leaves from the branches above him. The movement revealed the other bull, which he had been screening with his bulk. Tom drew breath with a soft hiss as he saw how much larger was the old patriarch than his attendant. His enormous head was drooping and his ears flapped gently. They were tattered and worn like the sails of a storm-battered ship. His small eyes were closed, the thick, pale lashes meshing, and the ooze from the gland behind his eye ran down his cheek in a long, damp smear. The bull's head was propped on his tusks. Tom marvelled at the length and girth of those ivory curves which reached down to the earth. They were so thick and heavy that there was hardly any taper from the lip to the blunt tip. He could see the bulge under the grey skin where a quarter of the length was buried in the skull. They must be an onerous burden for even such a mighty animal to carry through all the days of its life, he mused. Tom was so close now that he could clearly see a metallic blue fly settle on the bull's eyelashes. The elephant blinked to drive it away. At that moment, Tom felt a light touch on his arm and turned his head slowly to see Abelie nod at him. He turned back and focused his gaze on the outline of the bones of the bull's shoulder under the wrinkled, eroded skin. He picked out the exact spot Fundy had described to him, just behind the shoulder and two-thirds of the way down the mighty barrel of the chest. He raised the musket and slowly drew back the hammer to full cock muffling the click of the mechanism with his hand. Looking down the long barrel, he saw that the muzzle was almost touching the bull's flank. There was no need to use the pip at the foresight. Gently, he took up the pressure of the trigger, and the hammer dropped in a burst of blue-white sparks over the pan. There was that moment of delay that seemed as long as infinity, but was the smallest part of a second. Then the heavy weapon bellowed and pounded into his shoulder, knocking him back on his haunches and blinding him with a cloud of white powder smoke which obscured the body of the elephant. A moment after his shot, he heard Abelie fire. All around him, the tranquil forest erupted in a rush of mighty bodies. Trumpeting and squealing, the herd plunged through the undergrowth then trees swayed and crashed down under the onslaught. Tom dropped the heavy gun, reached back, seized the second musket from the man behind him, and sprang to his feet. He ran into the thick cloud of smoke. As he emerged on the far side, he saw the plunging hindquarters of the bull disappear as the scrub closed behind him. Chase him! Abelie shouted at his shoulder, 
and they raced after the fleeing bull. All around they heard the cows and squealing calves crashing through the undergrowth. Thorns and branches tore at Tom, but he ignored the ripping of his clothing and the scratching at his skin and ran on along the pathway that the bull had riven through the scrub. He burst out onto the open bank of one of the pools, and the beast was fifty feet ahead of him, his ears spread and the curves of his tusks showing yellow on each side of his baggy hindquarters as he bore directly away from Tom at full run. His stubby tail tuft was held high, and Tom could see the knuckles of his spine running down the curve of his back to join the tail. He swung up the musket and fired at the spine. The bull dropped into a sitting position on his haunches and skidded down the bank. But the bull must have grazed the spine rather than smashed it. He was paralysed for but a second. As he reached the bottom of the bank, he came up on all four legs again and splashed through the head of the pool and up the far bank. Aboli ran alongside Tom and fired across the pool. They both saw the bull raise a puff of dried mud from the back of the bull's skull, but he shook his head, clapping his ears against his flanks, and disappeared into the dense bush on the far side. Tom grabbed his third musket from the panting sailor who handed it to him and plunged down the bank in pursuit of the bull. Aberley ran beside him, and they could see the course the bull was breaking through the forest. The treetops were shaking, and there was a rustling, crackling wake through the bush, like that of a breaching whale beneath the surface of the sea. Suddenly there was a thudding outburst of musket fire out on the right flank where the other hunters were hidden, and Aberley grunted, uh, The other bulls have run into Alf and Luke. Running together, they skirted the edge of the pool, and plunged into the bush on the far side. The path the bull had torn through was closing behind him, and they struggled on with difficulty, losing cloth and skin to the thorns. Oh, we'll never catch him now, Tom gasped. He will run clear away from us. But when they burst out into a clearing at last, they both shouted with triumph as they saw the great bull only a pistol shot ahead. He was hard hit. His run had been reduced to an unsteady walk and his head was hanging, his tusks ploughing long furrows in the soft earth, and pale, frothy blood was bubbling from the tip of his trunk. "Eh, hey, your first shot was a lung hit!' Aberley shouted, and they ran forward with renewed vigour, swiftly overhauling the wounded beast. Ten paces behind him, Tom dropped on one knee. He was gasping for air his heart pounding and his hands shaking as he tried to take a bead on the swaying hindquarters, aiming once again for the spine. He fired, and this time the ball flew true from the rifled barrel. In the instant before the smoke obscured his vision, he saw it plough into the wide grey back, shattering the vertebra above the tail. The bull dropped onto its haunches once again. Tom scrambled to his feet and ran out to one side so that he could see around the smoke bank. The elephant was sitting facing him, shaking its head with fury and agony, the great tusks held high, blowing a carmine cloud of blood from the tip of its trunk. Its death squeals seemed loud enough to split Tom's skull and burst his eardrums. Aberley fired at the head, and though they both saw the ball struck the domed forehead, it could not penetrate the fortress of bone in which the brain was buried. The main beast tried to drag its crippled back legs behind it and reach its tormentors. Both men ran back, well out of reach of the swinging trunk, and with unsteady hands poured powder into the muzzles of their muskets, rodded down the wadding and the balls, then crept forward, circling to find an opening, to get in close before firing into the barrel of the chest. Again and again they ran back to reload, then came forward to fire. Gradually the strength of the beast leaked out of him from the mouths of twenty running wounds, and with a last groan he fell over on his side, stretched out those fabulous tusks, and was still. Tom went forward cautiously. He reached out with the muzzle of the musket, touching the tiny eye, fringed with pale lashes and brimming with almost human tears. It did not blink. The bull was dead at last. He wanted to shout his triumph, but instead he found himself overwhelmed by a strange, almost religious melancholy. 
Abeli came to stand beside him, and when their eyes met, Abeli nodded in understanding. Yes, he said softly. You have learned what it means to be a true hunter, for you have understood the beauty and the tragedy of what we do. Between them, Alf and Luke had brought down one of the other bulls, but the third had escaped the ambush and had run off unscathed with the rest of the herd into the forest. Tom wanted to follow him, but both Fundi and Abuli laughed at him. You will never see him again. He will run for twenty miles without stopping, and then he will walk another fifty miles faster than you could run. That evening they dined like princes on tough, rank elephant cheek meat, roasted on green stick skewers over the coals, and drank the muddy pool water tainted with elephant urine, as though it were the finest claret. They slept like dead men beside the fire. Over the next two days they drew the tusks from the two bulls, chopping them out of the skull, taking infinite pains not to mark or mar the ivory. Fundy showed them how to free the long conical nerve from the cavity in the butt of each tusk and stuff the hole with green grass. Then they used bark rope to secure the four huge tusks to carrying poles. When they set out on the long march back to where they had left the boats, it took four men to carry each tusk. When they reached the river again, they cached the tusks on the bank, burying them so deep that even the hyena could not dig them out and chew them to splinters. Then they went on upstream in the longboats. Each day they found fresh elephant sign, more plentiful, and they followed on foot, sometimes killing within a few miles. At other times they were forced to march for days to catch up with the herds. Within a month they had harvested enough ivory to make a full load for both longboats. All the white men were ragged and exhausted. The fat had been burned off them, their bearded faces were gaunt and their bodies skeletal. Only Abeli and Fundi seemed unaffected by the hardships of the hunt. There was general rejoicing when Tom announced his decision to turn back to Fort Providence. That night at the campfire, Abeli and Fundi came to where Tom sat, staring into the dying flames, thinking of Sarah, anticipating their reunion. They squatted on each side of him, and he considered their dark faces thoughtfully before he spoke. This is grave business, he said with certainty. I can see that you mean to spoil my contentment and my pleasure at the return to Fort Providence, he sighed with resignation. Very well. What is it? Ufundi says that we are very close to the lands of his people, the Lotsi. How close? Tom asked suspiciously. By now he spoke the Lotsi language with confidence, and he had learned what Fundi considered very close. Ten days' travel, Fundi said confidently. But when Tom stared at him accusingly, he dropped his eyes. Or perhaps a very little further, he admitted. So Fundi wishes to return to his own people, Tom asked. And I will go with him, said Abeli quietly. Tom felt a stab of alarm. He stood up and led Abeli out of the firelight, then turned on him almost angrily. What is this? Tom asked. Do you wish to leave me and go back to Africa? Abeli smiled. I leave you only for a while. You and I have become branch and vine of the same tree. We can never be put asunder. Then why do you go without me? For many years the Lotsi have been hounded by the slavers. If they caught a glimpse of your white face, he shrugged expressively. No, I will go with Fundi. We will take trade goods with us, as much as we can carry. Fundi says that his tribe has a store of ivory from the elephant they have taken in their pitfalls and from the carcasses of those old animals they have found dead in the forest. With Fundi to calm their fears and with samples of our goods to show them, perhaps I can open up a road of trade with the Lotsi. How will I find you again? I will come to you at Fort Providence. Fundi says that I can buy a canoe from his tribe. Perhaps my canoe will be loaded with riches when we meet again. Abeli placed an avuncular hand on Tom's shoulder. You have shown that you are a mighty hunter in these last days, but now it is time for you to rest. Go back to the woman who waits for you and make her happy. I shall return before the season changes, 
and the big wet begins. The next morning, Abele and Fundi lifted the heavy bundles of trade beads, copper wire and cloth onto their heads, balancing them easily so their hands were free to hold their weapons, and set off westward along the river bank. Tom walked a little way beside Abele, then stopped and watched his old comrade disappear among the tall riverine forest trees before he turned away sadly and went down to where the longboats were loaded and moored against the bank. Shove off, he ordered, as he took his seat at the tiller of the leading boat. Take us back to Fort Providence. And they cheered him as they went to the oars and ran down with the current towards the east. The lookouts on the hill above Fort Providence spotted the longboats as soon as they rounded the last bend upstream, and Sarah was dancing with excitement on the beach when Tom stepped ashore. She rushed into his arms, but after the first embrace drew back and stared into his face, appalled by what she saw. "'You're starved,' she said, "'and dressed like a scarecrow in rags.' Then she wrinkled her nose. "'When last did you bathe?' She led him up the hill, but would not let him into the little cottage. You'll stink out all my hard work. First she filled the galvanised hip bath, which stood under the wild fig tree in the backyard, with steaming water. Then she undressed him, set aside his rags for later washing and mending, and sat him in the bath as though he were a little boy. She sponged away the accumulated dust and filth of the weeks of hard hunting, combed out his thick black hair and braided it into a sailor's pigtail. With her scissors, she trimmed the shaggy bush of his beard into the neat, pointed style that King William had made fashionable. She anointed all the scratches and cuts that covered his legs and arms with a salve she fetched from Dr. Reynolds' surgery. Tom reveled in the attention. At last she helped him into fresh, lovingly ironed shirt and breeches. Only then did she take his hand and lead him into the cottage. Proudly she displayed everything she had done in his absence, from the easy chair that the carpenters had made especially for him, to the broad double bed in the back room and the mattress she had sewn and filled with dried kapok from the silk cotton trees that grew along the river bank. Tom eyed the bed with a wicked grin. It looks to be a fine piece of work, but I had best test it before I give a firm opinion, he said and chased her giggling twice around it before she allowed herself to be captured and lifted onto the embroidered covers. Afterwards they lay and talked while the sun set, and then long into the night. He told her of all he had done and seen. He described the hunting to her, and the new strange lands they had found, the forests and the far blue mountains, and the marvellous animals and birds they had discovered. It's so big and endless and beautiful and wild, he told her and held her close. We never saw another man, nor any sign of anyone in all our journey. It's all ours, Sarah, ours for the taking. Will you take me with you next time? she asked, jealous of his attention, wanting to share the wonders of it all with him. Somehow she never doubted that there would be a next time. She saw that he had fallen in love with this land, as much as he was in love with her, she knew that from now on they were both a part of it. Yes, he agreed. Next time you shall be with me to see it. There was so much to tell and to discuss that it took more than one long night. Over the lazy weeks that followed, while the men rested and recuperated from the hunting, Tom and Sarah spent hours alone each day. He read to her from the journal he had kept during the expedition, so that he overlooked no detail, and when he had told it all to her, they discussed and planned the future. We have been lucky to discover this Lunga River, or rather to have Fundi show it to us, Tom told her. The old Portuguese explorers must have overlooked it, and the Arabs also. Fundi tells me that the Arab trading routes, the slave road, is a long way further to the north. He smiled ruefully. If Fundi says it is a long way, you can believe it is a hundred miles or more. With luck, neither the Omani nor John Company will ever find us here. Fort Providence is a perfect entrepot to the interior. The elephant herds hereabouts have never been hunted, and if Abeli and Fundi can make contact with the tribes, we can open up trade with them and have it all to ourselves. But where will you sell the ivory? she asked. Not in Zanzibar or any other Arab port, nor any place where the company has a factory. 
Brother Guy will never let you rest if he finds where you are. We can never go back to England. She tried not to sound wistful and hurried on. Where can we sell our goods and buy the necessities? Powder and shot, medicines and flour, candles and oil, rope and canvas and pitch? There is such a place close at hand, Tom assured her. As soon as the long rains begin, the big wet, we will pull out of here and sail down to Good Hope. The Dutch at the Cape will be hot for our ivory, and even hotter to sell us all the goods we can pay for. Best of all, they won't give a brass gilder or a morsel of their old cheese for the warrant of arrest placed on me by the Lord Chancellor of England. There was much to keep every man in the fort busy during the weeks when they waited for Aberley to return. All the ivory had to be cleaned, weighed and packed with dry grass to prevent it being damaged during the voyage. Then the little swallow had to be careened on the beach below the fort, her bottom scraped clean of weed. The shipworm that had taken hold in her planking had to be burned out with boiling pitch. Once she was afloat again, they repainted her, stitched the rents in her canvas and made small changes to her rigging so that she would not be recognised as the ship in which they had escaped from England. It was a sailor's superstition that it was bad luck to change a ship's name. But there was no help for it. They scraped the old name from her transom and painted the new one over it. When they relaunched her, Sarah broke a bottle of brandy from the ship's stores over her bows. I renamed this ship Centaurus, she intoned. May God bless her and all who sail in her. Then the ivory was taken aboard the Centaurus and carefully loaded into her holds. They refilled her water casks and made all ready for the voyage southwards. Now each afternoon the thunderheads began to build up along the northern horizon, mountains that reached up into the heavens. The sunset turned the cloud ranges purple and sullen scarlet, the lightning flickered in their bellies, and the far thunder muttered the threat of the coming wet season. The first rains burst upon them, sweeping across the hills in trailing robes of grey. For three days and nights thunder bombarded them and the air was filled with water as though they lay beneath a mighty waterfall. Then the storm clouds opened and in that lull a dozen long dugout canoes came fast down the swollen waters of the Lunga River. In the lead canoe stood Abeli, tall and scar-faced. Tom shouted with joy and ran down to the beach to welcome him ashore. Fundy was in the last canoe, but the oarsmen were all strangers. The bottom of each craft was stacked with elephant tusks, none as large as those that Tom's expedition had taken, but valuable nonetheless. The oarsmen were all of the Lotzi tribe, kinsmen of Fundy. Despite his assurances, they were terrified of the strange white men of Fort Providence. They expected to be taken as slaves, chained together and marched away, as had happened to so many of their tribe. Gone never to be seen or heard of again. They were mostly old men, grey and bent, or uninitiated striplings. They huddled together on the beach, not to be reconciled or comforted by any of Tom's reassurances in Lotzi. They have come with us only because Bongola, their chief, ordered them to do so, Abeli explained. When he saw the trade goods we brought with us, his greed surpassed his fear of the slavers. Still, he would not come himself to trade, but sent the least important members of the tribe in his stead. They brought the ivory ashore from the canoes and weighed it, then discussed a fair price for it with Fundy. I do not want to spoil the trade by overpaying them, Tom explained to Sarah, but neither do I want to bilk them and kill the trade before it begins. In the end, the bags of Venetian trade beads, bolts of cloth, crates of hand mirrors and axe heads and bales of copper wire were loaded into the canoes and the rowers were sent home. Their little flotilla shot upstream against the current, propelled by men so thankful to have escaped with their lives that they rowed with the strength of demons, hysterically chanting their gratitude for their escape to their tribal gods and ancestors as they disappeared around the first bend. They will be back next season. Abeli prophesied. Bongolo will see to that. Fundi and three of the bolder Lotzi, who had remained with him, agreed to stay on at Fort Providence during the big wet and protect the buildings and gardens against the ravages of the weather and wild animals. 
The rest of the party loaded the last of the ivory and went aboard the Centaurus. As the full onslaught of the rains washed over them, they let the swollen river and the monsoon wind drive the little Centaurus downstream and out into the ocean of the Indies. The course to clear Madagascar and make for good hope is southeast by south. Mark it on the Travis board, if you please, Mr. Tyler, Tom ordered. Southeast by south it is, Captain. Full and by, Mr. Tyler, said Tom, who took Sarah's hand and led her to the bows. They stood together and watched the flying fish explode from the surface of the Mozambique Channel and spin away in silvery blurs like new-minted coins tossed across the blue current. If I can find a priest at Good Hope, will you marry me, Sarah Beatty? he asked. That I will, Thomas Courtney. She laughed and hugged him closer. That I will. The little Centaurus anchored in Table Bay on a sunny morning in which the southeaster chopped bursts of white off the tops of the wavelets. They went ashore under the towering mountain whose flat top was covered by the famous tablecloth, a stationary bank of roiling white cloud. The settlement had grown in size since last they had visited the Cape. The strictures of the Dutch East India Company against foreigners owning land or taking up residence in its territory were every bit as draconian as those of its English counterpart. However, Tom soon discovered that for a few golden guilders placed in the hands of the right official, these laws could be waived. Once they had paid their dues, the welcome they received from the burghers was convivial, especially as the Centaurus was well burdened and the Dutch merchants smelt profits in their visit. They planned to stay in the Cape until the rains on the Fever Coast had passed. As their quarters aboard the Centaurus were cramped and the motion of the ship at anchor was uncomfortable, Tom found lodgings for himself and Sarah in one of the little guest houses below the company gardens run by a manumitted Malay woman who was a wonderful cook and hostess. In the first week, Tom visited all the merchants whose warehouses lined the waterfront, and was delighted to find that the demand for ivory was strong. He struck several good bargains for the sale of their cargo. The crew were given their first pay and share of the profits since they had sailed from England. Over the next few months, most of them spent everything they had earned in the ale shops and bawdy houses of the town, but Ned Tyler and Dr Reynolds used theirs to purchase small holdings of land in the Constantia Valley on the far side of the mountain. Tom and Abberley used nearly all of their share to buy the necessary stores for another season at Fort Providence and a goodly stock of the trade goods on offer in the warehouses of the colony. Tom gave Sarah fifty pounds from the prize, which she used to assemble her trousseau. It included a small harpsichord and a baby cradle on wooden rockers, which she painted with floral wreaths and choirs of cherubs. The entire crew were in the congregation of the little church in the gardens, when Tom and Sarah were married, and after the ceremony they carried the newlyweds on their shoulders down the street to their lodgings, singing all the way and pelting them with handfuls of rose petals. In one of the waterside taverns, Aberley found a sun-wizened little Dutchman named Andries van Houten, who had been brought out from Amsterdam as a gold finder for the Dutch East India Company. I have scoured the mountains as far as Stellenbosch, van Houten told Aberley after the third tankard of ale had slid effortlessly down his gullet, his Adam's apple bobbing in his red wrinkled throat. There is no gold in this devil-damned colony, but I can smell it in the north. He sniffed the air. If only I could find the ship to take me up the coast. And he looked at Abberley hopefully. But I don't have a gilder in my purse to pay my passage. Abberley brought him to see Tom, and they talked every evening for a week. In the end, Tom agreed to purchase all the prospecting equipment that Van Houten needed and take him to Fort Providence when they sailed. Those pleasant days at Good Hope passed too swiftly, and they were soon reloading the Centaurus, taking great care with Sarah's harpsichord and the cradle. As the season changed and the oak trees that lined the streets dropped their leaves, they hoisted the anchor and sailed northwards around Cape Point and into the Mozambique Channel again. 
When they entered the mouth of the Lunga River and forged their way upstream, they saw the high water mark on the banks and the debris hanging in the branches of the trees that showed just how strong had been the flood during the months of the big wet. When they reached the hilly country, the forest was green and burgeoning with new growth. Faithful to the trust they had placed in him, Fundy met them at the landing below Fort Providence and proudly showed Tom how well he had cared for everything in their absence. They set to rethatching the roofs of the huts and repairing the weak spots in the palisade. Sarah had her new harpsichord installed in the front room of their cottage and played and sang for Tom every evening after dinner. She placed the painted baby cradle beside their bed in the back room. The first night Tom eyed it as he sat on the bed and pulled off his boots. "'I take that as a challenge, Mistress Courtney,' he told her. "'Shall we see what we can do about filling it?' They did not have much time to devote to the task, for within weeks Tom was ready to take the first hunting party upriver. Van Houten was in the leading boat, sitting on his wooden box of chemicals, with his gold pan stacked at hand. He prospected every gravel bed and sandbank they passed. When they went ashore to hunt the elephant herds, Van Houten did not join them, but wandered away with his two Lozi helpers to search the hills and streams for traces of the precious metal. The hunting was good this season. Within a month they had filled the boats with ivory and set out to retrace their steps to Fort Providence. Sarah accompanied Tom on the second expedition, bringing with her the paint box she had bought in good hope. She filled the pages of her sketchbooks with images of the journey. They followed the river further than ever before, and at last reached the country of the Lotzi. At the first village, the entire population fled into the forest, and it took several days before they came creeping out timidly from among the trees. After Fundi and Abeli had overcome their initial fear and suspicion, they began a friendly relationship with the tribe. They found that the Lotzi were generally a pleasant and cheerful people, Though small in stature, they were well-formed and handsome. Some of the women were beautiful, with fine nilotic features. They went bare-breasted, and their carriage was graceful and proud. Abeli had a long, serious discussion with the village elders, and the outcome was that for a few rolls of copper wire and a small bag of glass beads, he acquired two of the prettiest, plumpest virgins as wives. The girls were named Fala and Zeti. It was difficult to tell who was better pleased with the bargain, the bridegroom or the little brides, preening in the new finery Abeli had given them as part of the bride price, and gazing at their husband with awe and reverence. Dr. Reynolds, with Sarah to assist him, successfully treated many of the sick Lotzi, which sealed the good relations with the tribe. When the expedition went on upriver to the capital kraal of the Lotzi, the drums carried ahead of them the news of their coming. Their paramount chief, Bongola, came down to the landing to welcome them and lead them to the new huts that had been built especially in their honour. Bongola's village was a cluster of several hundred thatched huts built along the river bank and on the slopes of the hills. Each hut was set around with a shamba of mango and plantain trees and manioc plants. Kraals of logs housed the scrubby cattle and goats of the tribe, and kept them safe from the nocturnal forays of leopard and hyena. By this time, Tom and Abeli were both fluent in the language, and they held long indabas with Bongola each day of their stay. Bongola was a naturally garrulous little man, and he related the recent history of the tribe to Tom. The Lotzi had once held rich lands on the banks of the great freshwater lake to the north, but then the slavers had arrived and fallen upon them like the cheetah on the gazelle herds of the plains. The survivors had fled southwards, and for almost two decades now had evaded further depredations. But each day they lived in terror of the slavers, whom they knew were slowly driving their raiding columns deeper into the interior. We know that one day we will have to fly again, Bongola told Tom. That was why we were filled with such alarm when we heard of your arrival. Tom remembered Abeli's stories of how he had been captured by the slavers when he was a child. He remembered also those unfortunates he had seen in the slave markets of Zanzibar and felt once again that deep abhorrence of the trade and anger 
at his own inability to ease the plight of these people, 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 ease the plight of these people.